All right, I'm gonna ask everybody to take their seats. We're gonna get ready to begin. All right, good morning and welcome to the Public Safety Committee's Fiscal 2020 Preliminary Budget Hearing. Today we will hear testimony from the Commissioner, from Commissioner O'Neill and his staff, followed by the Civilian Complaint Review Board at 12.30 p.m. And lastly, we will hear public testimony. Later in the afternoon, Public Safety will also hold a joint hearing with the Committee on the Justice System and we'll hear from the District Attorneys, Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, HRA's Office of C Civil Justice, and Legal Aid Society. The Police Department's fiscal 2020 preliminary budget totals $5.6 billion, an increase of $6 million from the fiscal year 2019 adopted budget. This represents a minimal change to the department. More than 90% of its budget supports personnel services, while less than 10% supports other than personal services. The department's budget supports a budgeted headcount of approximately 52,000 personnel, which includes roughly 36,000 uniform personnel and 16,000 civilians. The budget reflects new and enhanced enhanced initiatives such as new civilian personnel to manage body-worn camera footage and increased funding for crisis intervention training. I look forward to hearing about funded and ongoing initiatives such as the Neighborhood Coordination Officer Program, the Department's internal disciplinary process, and the organization of the Special Victims Division and Domestic Violence Unit. As Chair of the Public Safety Committee, I'm looking forward to working with the Department on numerous issues over the next year. Today we look to, to working together with the Department to improve budget transparency and oversight. Today I hope to learn more about the department's new initiatives, its capital programming, and the budget priorities for fiscal year 2020. I would like to thank the committee staff for their hard work, Nevin Singh, our financial analyst, Aisha Wright, our finance unit head, Casey Addison, our senior policy analyst, and Daniel Addis, our senior counsel. As you can see, we have a lot to discuss today and a lot to consider, so let's begin. I'd like to welcome Commissioner O'Neill and his staff. Thank you for being here today. And let me just acknowledge my colleagues were also joined by Council Members Cohen, Brannon, and Lanceman. Uh, once again, thank you for being here and you may begin when you're ready. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and answer uh, all questions to the best of your ability? I do. Morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the mayor's preliminary budget for the 2020 fiscal year. It's a pleasure to be here and to testify before the City Council's Committee on Public Safety about the outstanding work the members of the New York City Police Department have been doing and continue to do around the clock each day and night. The bottom line is we need the public to know that each of us has a stake in keeping us all safe. Before highlighting some key budget issues, I will update you on our core mission and several significant public safety initiatives. I will be as brief as I can so our team can field as many of your questions as possible in the time we have available this morning. First, I'd like to thank New Yorkers for the outpouring of support. They showed the NYPD following the February death of Detective Brian Simonson of the 102 Detective Squad. Like all NYPD members, who made the ultimate sacrifice on behalf of the people we serve. Detective Simonson was killed by doing what we asked him of him, and that was fighting crime and keeping people safe. There is no more selfless act than that. What Detective Simonson did for this great city and what his family and all line of duty family now must endure will never be forgotten by any one of us. In 2019, with every New Yorker entitled to safety, I believe the NYPD is at a turning point, a moment of opportunity never seen before in the city. We stand on the threshold of taking our nation's safest big city and making it safe on every block, on every street, in every neighborhood. A city in which every neighborhood is as important as every other, where every child can grow up free of the threat of crime. We can now do this because neighborhood policing has been institutionalized in every precinct, every public housing command, and as of last month, three quarters of all transit districts, with the rest coming in the spring. The NYPD also launched neighborhood policing in New York City schools in the Bronx East sector at the start of the school year. We can now do this because the NYPD, we, we can do this now because the NYPD is ready to partner with every organization, every agency, and every person in the city of New York. 
In 2018, as you know, New York City experienced another remarkable year in reducing violence and property crime. Overall, index crime is at its levels, level here since 1957, more than 60 years ago. Robberies, burglaries, and auto thefts have all continued their downward trends. 2018 was the second year in a row we had fewer than 300 murders, again less than any year in New York since 1951 when there were half a million fewer people in our city. Our current murder rate of 3.4 per 100,000 residents is among the lowest in the nation. Also in 2018, we recorded the lowest number of shootings in New York City's modern history for the third year in a row. On five separate occasions, the city went five or more days without a recorded murder, including for nine consecutive days spanning November 25th to December 3rd. And for the first time ever, the NYPD recorded three straight months, October, November, and December, below 20 murders. We did see a substantial increase in reported rapes over the last year. We know that part of this is attributable to the NYPD's substantially increased outreach efforts to help survivors report what happened. We, know, we now have advocates inside every police station house specifically for domestic violence victims and victims of other crimes. Last year, we saw an increase of more than 300 walk-in reports at precincts of sexual assault complaints. We also know that, and this is a belief shared by survivors' advocates with whom we regularly meet, that rape has been and continues to be our number one underreported crime. In fact, about a quarter of the rapes reported in 2018 took place prior to 2018. To me and to the entire NYPD leadership, that means we are successfully building trust with survivors, and it is crucial that we continue on that path. This historic underreporting is beginning to be addressed in a substantial and vitally important way. As you know, last year we conducted a complete overhaul of our entire Special Victims Division, now led by Deputy Chief Judith Harrison. We are renovating and upgrading facilities, adding more highly trained personnel, and fine-tuning our response to survivors of these horrific crimes to make sure we provide every service and every comfort they need. And our Special Victims Detectives are working to fully investigate both past and current year sex assaults with a thoroughness and sensitivity that provides all survivors with empathy, closure, and justice. The NYPD will never rest in our determination to drive down the crime of rape, one of the most heinous of all violent offenses, and we therefore will never stop looking for ways to innovate and improve our practices in this area. Our cops now regularly work the same shifts in the same sectors. They're getting to know their neighborhoods, their community residents, their local problems, and their local criminals. They're getting the time and latitude to work at solving local crime and quality of life concerns. And the result is a more flexible, more responsive, more measured, and more effective police presence. Investigations are also more focused with patrol cops playing an expanded role in gathering evidence and information and precinct detective squads working in closer coordination with specialty squads like gang and narcotics to bring in more and even stronger cases against violent criminals. And because we involve our six local district attorneys or the U.S. attorneys for the southern or eastern districts from the outset, we're able to pre-indict many offenders before they are arrested charge them appropriately, and then see their cases through to meaningful prison sentences. We also support our new approach with major improvements in training and technology, all implemented in the past five years. Perhaps most importantly, we decentralized and democratized technology and data access in the department, equipping all officers with smartphones that connect them to databases, to the public, and to each other. We have gone from cops who lacked email addresses or any other way that it, than a police radio to communicate in the field to officers who now have instant access to a wide range of information and functionalities who, who regularly share their cell phone numbers and email addresses with local residents and businesses. On the enforcement side, during the past five years, street stops by our officers are down by more than 90 percent citywide. Even as we improve monitoring and supervision to make sure that all stops are being reported by the officers who find them necessary to make. Overall arrests are down 37.3 percent and summonses are down nearly 79 percent. Marijuana misdemeanor and violation arrests are down 71 percent. As we believed we could in 2014, we have shown that we can drive crime down significantly with a far less intrusive enforcement profile. While arrests and summonses for quality of life violations and minor crimes are way down, felony arrests for rape, assault, grand larceny, and burglary are all up. And while many misdemeanor arrest categories have fallen steeply, detective bureau arrests are up nearly 20 percent in the last five years. Detective arrests are based on exhaustive investigations that specifically direct our enforcement efforts with laser-like focus on the serious crimes and the serious offenders who are a relatively small percentage of the population. 
It can also be said that 2018 was a milestone in the NYPD's historic 25-year crime-fighting period. The murder rate is a tenth of what it once was. Total crime has been cut by 78 percent. We say that we are the safest large city in America, and we certainly are when our citywide crime rate is compared to the other big cities in the country. However, there are still stubborn pockets of crime, and especially violent crime, in New York. In fact, in 2018, there were six precincts with violent crime rates more than twice as high as the rest of the city. The four-row precinct in the Bronx had the highest overall rate, including the second highest robbery rate and the third highest assault rate. The 7-3 precinct in Brooklyn had the third highest rate, including the second highest murder rate and the highest shooting rate. Other precincts, the 4-1, the 4-2 in the Bronx, the 7-5 in Brooklyn, and the 2-5 in Manhattan together lead the city in violence. So let me be clear. Even these six precincts have seen huge drops in violent crime since the early 1990s, but we will never be satisfied with that. We can always do better, and we must do better. The NYPD and our city have a moral obligation to these precincts because everyone who lives and works in New York City deserves to live in safety, free of fear. Our achievements do give us reason to make the following declaration. We vow not to rest until every block and every neighborhood enjoys the same level of safety and well-being as the rest of the city. Our city will always face challenges, challenges that test our crime-fighting strategies at the most local of levels, and challenges that test our intelligence gathering and preparedness at a citywide and even a global scale. And that important work continues around the clock every day of the year with our analysts, our cops, and our many partners on the FBI NYPD Joint Terrorism Task Force. It was the first JTTF in the nation formed in December 1980, and now is comprised of 300 investigators from 56 agencies. 113 of whom are NYPD cops. Additionally, the NYPD's Critical Response Command works 24-7 protecting sites and infrastructure around the city, and cops and our strategic response group are at the ready to rapidly respond to any emergency threat. Be it an active shooter situation or other terror incident, along with our elite ESU Emergency Service Unit, they are all informed by our first-rate intelligence bureau, which continues to be the industry leader in detecting, deciphering, and responding to an always fluid threat stream. There is a new, this is a new era in so many ways. We know, for example, that the legalization of marijuana is coming, and we need to determine how and when laws about use and possession are enforced. I have concerns about home cultivation, for instance, and driving while impaired, because there is currently no instant test for marijuana levels in the human body. I also have great concerns about people under 21 years of age smoking marijuana. We are also facing pushback from some quarters about the definition of who constitutes a threat to public safety when it comes to fare evasion in our subway. One thing is clear to me, however, this city and its police must always control access to the transit system. To abandon our efforts there would be both irresponsible and highly dangerous. Marijuana and fare evasion are just two examples of the changing playing field, but our future also presents an entirely new possibility. It is now possible to think about how we can equip and enable our cops to help kids avoid a first act of criminal behavior. And, we'll approve that when the and we will prove that when the public and police work together, we can make positive, lasting change in our society. That change begins when people are safe, and it is sustained when they feel safe, too. Our aim is to keep raising the bar for fair and effective policing in this country year after year, again and again. And we are doing it with the help of New Yorkers in every neighborhood. And I ask each of you and the people you represent to continue think, to think of ways that together we can make every single part of the city as safe as our safest streets today. Turning to budgetary issues, the NYPD plans to again apply for and obtain federal assistance to protect members of the public and critical infrastructure, including the financial district, the transit system, bridges, tunnels, and ports. Although we have already started planning for the federal fiscal year 2019 preparedness grant funding process, the applications guideline for the Homeland Security Preparedness Grants have not yet been released. This is because the recent federal government shutdown, including the Department of Homeland Security and the Federal Emergency Management Agency, delayed the approval of the FY fiscal year 19 appropriations. The NYPD relies on these funds to help protect all New Yorkers and visitors to our city against terrorist attacks, to strengthen our homeland security preparedness. As our nation's top terror target, New York City has been the target of about 30 terror plots since the devastating 9-11 attacks. These plots have included a suicide bomber in a subway passageway beneath Times Square, the fatal truck attack on pedestrians and bicyclists across along the West Side Highway, plans to place bombs among the festive crowds watching the July 4th fireworks over the East River, and an ISIS plot to capture on video the beheading of a woman in Manhattan. 
Federal Homeland Security funds buy us a lot, including our bomb squad's total containment vessel, a rolling vault that allowed the NYPD to remove the live pressure cooker bomb planted on a street in Chelsea and some of the 16 pipe bombs mailed to CNN and Columbus Circle and other recipients throughout New York and the country. The money also funds our vapor wake dogs that patrol large-scale events searching for hidden explosives in our active shooter training that hones the tactical skills of thousands of officers who might one day have to face a machine gun wielding attack or in a crowded concert venue or a school. Federal funds have also allowed the NYPD to develop and sustain our sensor and information technology centerpiece known as the Domain Awareness System, or DAS, which supports the department's counterterrorism mission, mission. Higher intelligence research specialists deploy officers to the transit system and other strategic locations citywide based on intelligence and train officers to respond to chemical, ordnance, biological, and radiological threats or incidents, as well as active shooter scenarios. The NYPD also uses federal funds to purchase personal protective equipment for uniformed members of the service and to purchase other critical equipment that enhances our ability to protect New Yorkers and vital transportation and port infrastructure. Regarding the preliminary budget and its impact on the NYPD, the NYPD's fiscal year 2020 city tax levy expense budget is $5.3 billion. The vast majority of this, 92 percent, is allocated for personnel costs. Highlights in their preliminary budget include additional civilian staffing for the Body One Camera Program. This includes attorneys, media technicians, and IT personnel for a total of $6.3 million annually. Cabling upgrades and facility work totaling $12.5 million, most of which is to allow precincts to better upload body-worn camera footage to the NYPD's network. The balance of funds are for improvements to 137 Center Street, the facility for our Manhattan Special Victim Squad. Crisis intervention training, CIT training, $5.3 million annually to continue training our uniform members and to improve services provided to people with behavioral health challenges as they relate to the criminal justice system. This includes scenario-based training and crisis intervention techniques. The police department's 10-year capital commitment plan contains $1.99 billion for fiscal years 2019 through 2029. The September capital included additional funding for 100 old slip totaling 13.3 million. This funding will allow for a comprehensive renovation of 100 old slip, a historic landmark building located in the heart of Lower Manhattan's financial district. The NYPD will incorporate a public use space in addition to running a law enforcement operations facility. Across the NYPD, we will continue to leverage every tool available to us to keep New York City safe, including the use of new and innovative technology. We are keenly focused on technological advances and how they can be applied to fighting crime, creating safer and more efficient ways for police officers to do their jobs, and contributing to the important work of building trust. Building trust with the people we serve, fighting traditional crime, combating international terrorism, none of this is easy, but cops do not take these jobs because they are easy. People join the police department to make a difference, to do good, and NYPD members accomplish that every single day and they do it in, a newer, in newer and better ways every day, too. In closing, I can tell you our city is in much better shape today than it was when I became a cop in 1983. Those of you who lived here and worked here decades ago know it, know it too. This is not the same city it was in the 1980s and 1990s. And each year, we make even greater headway. Together, we are proving that New York City is the place that others across our nation want to emulate. And we are setting that tone through our brand of New York policing. Throughout the tremendous changes we continue to undertake in the NYPD, we have had the mayor's full support, and we have benefited greatly from the city council's support as well. Thank you for your own ongoing partnership and assistance and for everything you do to help us build a more effective and more efficient NYPD, always with officer safety in mind. I continue to be very optimistic about the future of the NYPD PD, and the direction in which we head. In my experience, there is a direct correlation between the level of community support for the police and success in fighting crime and terror. And so we will continue to work tirelessly to earn the trust and confidence of all New Yorkers and to ensure that there are even better days ahead. I look forward to working with each of you, and I thank you again for the opportunity to testify this morning. At this point, happy to take your questions. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. I almost don't know what to do with myself. Your testimony was so short today. <laughs> It means we're making progress. Uh, well, good morning and, and welcome. Um, before we discuss questions about the budget, were there any 
new items that the department requested from OMB uh, but did not receive funding for in the preliminary budget. Yep. Uh, ultimately, we're still working with OMB, as you know, through the executive budget. Our priorities, our budget priorities, uh, for the most part, were funded, but at, at the effort right now is to deal with the $52.6 million peg or budget reduction exercise that we've been asked to do. So we're working on that. Um, and there are some, the, the only real financial concerns we have on the new needs side revolve around things that we are currently operating but are unfunded in the out years and we're incorporating that in the conversations around the peg. Uh, to ensure we, we get the funding we need to maintain systems. It's largely IT funding and, facil and, and I'm sorry, and um, vehicle funding um, needed for life cycle replacement for some of the vehicles that we obtain through forfeiture funding um, to support neighborhood policing. Okay, and I'm gonna just ask the Sergeant Arams if you can go to slide number one um, because you, you spoke about the PEG and um, so in the actual uniform headcount, uh, this year, okay, there we go. Um, the headcount is eight is eight hundred over what is budgeted, along with your next academy class. The surplus is somewhere around twelve hundred uniform officers. So, although I understand, you know, you're working on the peg, I'm trying to get a, a understanding of how you're um, handling the peg if you're overhead count. So we're not actually overhead count. Uh, we saw the council's report and we've looked at it. Uh, the issue here becomes the council is taking the actual head count um, at the end of last year and now they're looking at the current head count. Because we have attrition throughout mm -hmm. the year, um, the number fluctuates. So we actually maintain what we call an average head count and we use an analysis that's based around a peak head count um, which helps us maintain that average headcount throughout the year, which, st which stabilizes our PS budget. So we are doing the same thing this year we've done in prior years, um, where we each time we have a class, and that's four times throughout the year, we hire up to our peak headcount, we have attrition, new people come into the academy, we go back to the peak headcount, um, and we, again, maintain an average headcount. We can share that analysis with you, but certainly the headcount numbers that you see for this fiscal year are on budget. They're what we are budgeted for, and OMB holds us accountable for that uh, every time we establish a class size. And which, uh, what, uh, can you just speak to the number, uh, the peak number? So the peak headcount uh, is 36,967 for fiscal 19, and, and the average headcount is 36,728 for fiscal year 19. And just go through your attrition rate for uniform and civilian officers. Well, that varies, so, uh, I mean, I have the, hold on, let me just see. So, uh, it really does vary from year to year. So, I mean, I have the attrition that's projected uh, for this year, which ends up being about 1,800 officers over the course of the year. But it varies, and this is largely based off of the class sizes that we had 20 years prior. So as people become eligible for retirement, it drives a, an attrition rate, and that's how we assess uh, projections for the class. But again, before we get authorization for a class, we're no longer looking at projections, we're looking at real attrition, and that's how we base the class sizes. All right, I don't want to debate this, but your, your actual number is 36,995. Are our numbers wrong? I'm not, we'll have to look at it, but this is, okay. you, you have something? And then what's your April class? How many people in your April class, if you can just speak to that? Right now, our April class would be projected to be 330 officers. Okay. Hey, Mr. Chair, Chair, uh, Chair. Chief Bill, Bill Morris, Chief of Personnel. Morning, morning, Chair. Just to give an example of what Commissioner Grippo is speaking about, as of this morning, our actual uniform number is 36,789. So that's about 200 off, off the number on the slide right there. So that's an example of how that number fluctuates. Yeah. Okay. And that's not counting attrition. That's our actual number. Actual head count. Of, right now. Okay. Got it. All righty, um, let's go into, um, so in fiscal 19, savings were accrued for delaying the hiring of 200 
uh, TEA, uh, TEAs, uh, traffic enforcement agents, will these TEAs be also hired in 2020? So the, those conversations are embedded in the conversations we're having around that peg. Um, as of now, we are planning to hire 250 TEAs in June, which would reflect us not reducing the number of TEAs in the fiscal year 20 uh, budget. So what that means in real English is, we, yes, we would have 200 additional TEAs budgeted next year than we had in fiscal 19 because we had done a one-year, one-time savings of 200 TEAs uh, where we didn't hire them this year. So you don't see a scenario where that's delayed again this year? Again, contingent on the PEG conversations, and we're looking at um, a lot of different things in those conversations. And so right now, the plan is still to move forward with 250 hiring class, which would bring us back up to the authorized headcount for fiscal 20. Okay. Uh, we also joined by Councilmember Menchaca and Valone. Uh, last year, uh, the council uh, called for an overhaul of uh, the city's expense budget structure to create new units of appropriation that correspond to actual program areas. And as part of the budget response called for, uh, we called for you to match the department's 18 different program areas in the budget function analysis. So for example, NYPD's budget has $3.5 billion or 62% under the units of appropriation operations. By expanding the eight uh, UAs to the 18 program areas, it would allow for more transparency in the NYPD's budget. Um, I know we've had some subsequent conversations on this. Will you work with the council to expand the number of units of appropriations this year? So, so the issue with this, um, it's actually, it's 21 budget functions that are uh, right now combined PSOTPS. So if we were to make units of individual units of appropriation for all 21 budget function areas, we would have 42 units of appropriation. And right now we have 14 U of A's. So the issue here really comes down to the work that would be involved and, and the difficulty in actually um, operationalizing this because on the PS side, you have to understand that we are constantly transferring employees or essentially authorizing overtime in different areas based off of need throughout the year. So what would happen is every single time we have a class coming out of the academy or every single time we are moving cops or promoting cops and then shifting their responsibilities, we would have to process budget mods. This would be an incredibly challenging and, and work, a work effort that would create a serious resource need for both us and OMB. And that's why we produce these, these reports, these budget function reports, which give the council transparency at the end of each year uh, for where our resources land. Um, it's the issue of doing it during the year that would create a, a burden. So, I mean, we're, we're happy to look at a combination of things. One, to see if there is a place in the middle that's less than 42 units of appropriation, which would be a huge challenge. Um, or, and secondly, looking at the reports that, that you currently get, um, albeit they are separate reports with, with information, but the budget function report ultimately shows you where our money was spent by Bureau. And then we have very detailed overtime reports that we've created um, as part of our compliance with local law or as part of our work with City Council Finance which breaks out how we're spending our overtime. We think you, you have transparency on the data. The issue becomes, you know, we're able to move the money throughout the year, which is on an as-needed basis and is critical to the way that we operate. So that's the challenge. So I, I will disagree a, a little bit there. I think that there is always better that we can do in this specific area. So if it's a resource question, um, perhaps we should have that conversation with OMB, um, but I didn't get a clear answer. Are you willing to work with the council in finding um, some middle ground yes. on this to improve transparency yes. in the budget? Yes. Okay. So we're going to get that going this year. 
Yes? Yes. Okay. All right. That's on the record. You took the oath. All right. Um, let's go into crisis intervention training quick. Um, can you provide details on which officers and units have received training and which ones will be trained this year? Good morning, Chief Shortell, Chief of Training. So far for uh, crisis intervention uh, team training, there's been a total of 11,970 active un uniform members of the service trained. That includes 808 of our lieutenants, 2,404 of our sergeants. Uh, we have three sessions per week. Uh, they're held uh, Monday through Thursday. Uh, this is in conjunction with the uh, Center for Urban Community Services through DOHMH. Uh, the officers and the recruits, they'll be trained in de-escalation and attend lectures and scenario-based trainings to recognize the signs and symptoms of mental health illness, better response to uh, these mental health distress, and improve communication with the public and reduce injuries to uh, officers. Uh, currently, we are... Uh, the targeted population that we'd like to see trained is by the end of uh, 2021. Uh, we prioritize uh, based on the, um, on the likelihood of our offices that are going to hit into people, in, intercede with people with uh, persons of crisis. We are also concentrating on where the diversion centers are opening up, one in the 2-5, one in the 4-7. We presently have 77% um, of all the officers trained in the 2-5. We presently have 54% of all the officers trained in the 4-7 uh, precinct. And I'm assuming we're trying to get to all of the, all patrol officers, anybody who deals, can you just speak specifically who you're training and how many people we have to go to train? All right, well, right now we're going, we have it in priority order. We have all members assigned to precinct patrol squads, all members assigned to transit patrol or homeless outreach units. Uh, we don't include administrative personnel. All members assigned to patrol the 2-5 uh, and the 4-7, which I just stated. All transit bureau NCOs and all members assigned to the uh, housing patrol bureau. Our ultimate goal is to, uh, to incorporate is 16,000 police officers, uh, sergeants, and lieutenants by the end of 2021. Right now, we're at uh, 11,970, so we'll do the math. It's uh, another 4,000 uh, to go. All right, and just go through, um, what is the training provided to DHS peace officers and school safety agents? Do school safety agents receive CIT, tra CIT training at all? All right, since the beginning of the Academy for the Department of Homeless Outreach and Security Shelter Division, peace officers, uh, we have 178 newly hired peace officers who have been given 40 hours of CIT, and this has been uh, tailored to the uh, shelter environment. Uh, as far as school safety agents, uh, we do a lot of de-escalation training at the uh, police academy, but we presently don't have CIT training per se for them. Um, but like I said, everything with uh, CIT, a lot of it is de-escalation, and the school safety officers receive that through a lot of their curriculum. Um, so we have concerns about that. We think uh, school safety agents should uh, receive CIT training, especially um, in the midst of, I think we held a hearing a, a few months ago on crises that are happening every day um, in our school system and a lot of young people being diverted into the 911 system and, and sent into ambulances. And we want to ensure that school safety agents who are dealing with students on a day-to-day -day basis are also trained here. So can we get a commitment that this is something we will explore as we move forward? Yeah. You have my commitment, I'll, I'll look to explore. I'll do that. Yeah, we'll, we'll make that commitment, but again, it can't be unfunded. The, the training okay. costs money, okay? Okay, yep. all righty. Um, let's go into neighborhood coordinating officers quickly. So last year, Commissioner, you expressed concern regarding crimes in the subway system. Can you provide an update on your policing efforts in the subway? Sure, Chief Delatory will do that. Ed. Good morning. Good morning. 
pull it out. So currently we have nine districts rolled out in neighborhood policing. Um, I'm going to just give you a quick uh, list of them. We started with District 12 and District 30 back in April of 2018. District 12 covers the Mott Haven, Morrisania, Park Chester, Soundview, East Chester, Bay Chester, Wakefield, Pelham Bay, Pelham Parkway, and Longwood areas. District 30 uh, covers the Greenpoint, Lafayette, Prospect, Park Slope, downtown Brooklyn, Brooklyn Heights, Carroll Gardens, and uh, the Dumbo area down under Manhattan Bridge overpass. In July, we uh, rolled out four more districts. It was July of 2018. Uh, we started with District 3, Upper West Side, Morningside Heights, Hamilton Heights, Washington Heights, Inwood, Marble Hill, Manhattan Valley, Manhattanville, Sugar Hill, Central Harlem North, and Central Harlem South. And we rolled out District 4, East Village, NoHo, SoHo, Lower East Side, Upper East Side, Murray Hill, Gramercy Park, East Harlem, Midtown East, Chinatown. We rolled out District 20 out in Queens, Woodhaven, Richmond Hill, Jamaica, Briarwood, Kew Gardens, Forest Hills, Jackson Heights, Long Island City, Queensbridge, Roosevelt Island, Willis Point, Corona, Elmhurst, Woodside, Sunnyside, and Astoria. And we rolled out District 32 in Brooklyn, East Flatbush, Park Slope, Crown Heights, Prospect Park, East New York, Brownsville. Then in January of this year, we rolled out District 2 in Manhattan. That covers Lower Manhattan, Battery Park, Tribeca, Soho, NoHo, West and Central Village, Gramercy Park, Murray Hill, Chelsea, Midtown West, Chinatown. In addition to that, we rolled out District 1, which is also Manhattan, but on the Upper West Side, Upper East Side, Lincoln Square, Lenox Hill, Columbus Circle, Midtown, Hell's Kitchen, Clinton, Times Square, and Diamond District. We also rolled out District 33 in Brooklyn, Ridgewood, Middle Village, Bushwick, East New York, Bedford-Stuyvesant, Williamsbridge, Brownsville, Cypress I, I don't Hills. know if you know, but he's going through every yeah. neighborhood in New York yeah. City. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm gonna, you know I'm what, I'm going to sure. stop you there. I'm actually, sure. Thank you, Commissioner, for I'm doing my sure job for me. I was I trying to be polite. Home. I'm going to hit your home. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got the point. Okay. All right. Um, so the, the let, final let me, three okay. districts. Okay, go ahead. Final three districts. I'm not going to go through the neighborhoods. But we have District 11 in the Bronx, <laughs> District 23 in Queens, and District 34. We should be rolling them out by the end of April. That's our target. Wow. In the spring, but okay. by the end of April. Already great. Um, can you just give me an example of what these NCOs are doing at train stations? So obviously there was a report on serial offenders um, in the subway stations as well. Can you just give me a clear, I mean, I'm a New Yorker. I'm a very busy guy. I have my headphones on. Uh, most mornings, uh, I do recognize some cops, uh, NCOs down, I think over downtown here somewhere, um, who often we say good morning. But for the everyday New Yorker, I see passing these NCO officers, there's very little interaction. So can you speak to what does the interaction between NCOs and busy New Yorkers look like? And how is this um, program, if, if you're going to utilize resources in the trains, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing, um, you know, what does that interaction look like for everyday New Yorkers, or are we just calling them neighborhood coordinating officers in a train station and they're standing around? Okay, now, so... Um, what metrics are there to measure what exactly... Okay, so here's, I can give you, uh, just off the top of my head, on, Janu on uh, March 15th, I'll give you an example. Uh, we had a station where we had chronic complaints about graffiti. Uh, the NCOs were working, the complaints were coming from the MTA workers and, uh, and from the public. And the, uh, it was a hashtag Donald Trump that somebody kept putting up on a the wall there. Uh, Glad so the, that. Did they clean that up? It, well, it was cleaned okay, up repeatedly. Great. It okay. was cleaned up repeatedly. But the idea was not just to keep cleaning it up. The idea was to capture the person okay. who did it. So work, the NCOs and the steady sectors working with transit actually created a dummy wall at the location. And our steady sectors now, understanding the, NC, the neighborhood policing um, philosophy, our steady sectors work in support of the NCOs. So our steady sectors actually were hiding behind the dummy wall that was created and finally captured the perpetrator who was 
putting the graffiti on the wall in that station. So that's just one recent example. I have numerous different success stories. Uh, but the idea is, is pretty, I, I would call it common sense. I mean, I, just like you, most of our riders have their faces in a, in a cell phone when they're on a train. So to reach our ridership, we're not going to have builder block meetings to get them. We have to reach them through that cell phone. So if you go through any station in the city at this point, <clears throat> where neighborhood policing is rolled out, you're either going to see a hard sign on a wall that has the two NCOs that are responsible for that station, along with the group station manager. So the group station manager in transit is the person who's responsible for anywhere from 15 to 25 stations. The transit model is very similar to the NYPD model now that, they've, that we have in place. The transit group station manager is almost like an NCO. They have, they're responsible for everything that goes on in the stations they're assigned. Our stations don't align perfectly because most of our NCOs have anywhere from 10 to 15 stations and the lines in between that connect them. Okay. But the group station managers have regular meetings with our NCOs. They exchange intelligence. Our NCOs give, us, give their cell phones out, not just to the group station managers, but to the station agents and to many of the workers that are in the, uh, okay. in the different stations. Okay. I don't want to cut you off because I know we have limited time with the commissioner. My colleague has uh, have questions as well. Uh, commissioner, so we held a hearing on the NCO program outside of just transit uh, this year, and I'm interested in knowing where we at in measuring success in this program. Um, how do we measure success? What are the metrics being ut utilized to ensure that NCOs are responsive in getting back to communities? Um, right now, they're doesn't seem to be any clear metrics that we can utilize to measure the success of this program. Yeah, so I know crime is going down and that's good, but how are we measuring um, if NCOs are actually engaging with communities? Yeah, there's a number of different methods that we're using, and Chief Donnie from uh, Strategic in Initiatives will talk about that. Jack? Good morning, Council Member. Jack Donio, Chief of Strategic Initiatives. So what we've uh, taken is an overlay of not just crime, but the, the questions of how we've built up trust with the community. That's measured by the types of interactions that we have and the number of interactions that we have with them and the quality of, of those, um, which is feedback that we receive through our NCOs and the NCO sergeants. So um, when you look at both crime reduction and the interaction internally that we have with our NCOs and our detectives and the willingness of people to interact with us and share more information, it demonstrates that there's an increase in trust. Um, what we are refining uh, are hardcore objective out uh, outcome measures that can help support that and we've uh, engaged with the RAND Corporation to be able to help us fine tune those, those hard outcome figures. Uh, but that's generally how we are attempting to do that now. So, and, and what are they actually studying? So can you just go through what, so the RAND Corporation, what are the specific things they're looking at? So RAND is looking at the the establishment of building trust within the community and defining those metrics to, to better determine how trust has been built. Uh, secondly, defining um, more precise metrics for collaboration, which um, we can leverage technology for. Uh, they're also uh, determining how neighborhood policing influences or impacts uh, the reduction in crime. What's the attrition rate and average length of tour for an NCO officer? So how are we doing there? As we've heard stories of NCOs coming in a few months and then leaving out. So what does that attrition rate look for Mr. them? Ch Mr. Chair, good morning. Chief Rodney Harrison, Chief of Patrol. All right, so just currently staff, I just to give you a couple of numbers. Uh, approximately we have 790 uh, POs, detectives throughout the 77 precincts. We have 77 sergeants. Uh, the attrition rate is uh, approximately about 25% for the POs and detectives and for the sergeants is 35%. Uh, and some of the reasons are, are usually good. One of the things is this is something where we want the neighborhood coordination officers to further their career. So, you know, 14 of them have moved on for 2018, 14 of them have gone into promotions, 
12 of them went into transfer into investigative units. Uh, other, another 21 to 25, it went to uh, external command. So um, this is a career path for the, for the uh, for police officers to become naval coordination officers, uh, take this challenge on, and then further their career to uh, uh, to help benefit the uh, the police department, especially going to the investigative units. Obviously, we're looking for most of them to stay as NCOs, and we're making sure that we're providing an incentive to do that. We we have promoted five percent of the NCOs to detective specialist, and there are going to be uh, periodic transfers. There are going to be uh, people that get promoted to uh, to sergeant. So. We, we kind of built that into the program, and quite frankly, there were some people that want to do the job that might not have the skills necessary to become uh, uh, an NCO, that, uh, the type of NCO that we need out there. So the, the only troubling part about that is that I think the attrition rates for your NCO program are much higher than um, regular POs. Um, so I'm trying to understand if these officers are supposed to be cemented in the fabric of communities and building that partnership and relationship um, should they move on so quickly when the program just began? If, if they're there for us to get back to that, the essence of the, the beat cop, um, would you? I, 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 get, I, get, I get what you're driving at. Uh, Rodney, you said 75% of them are being retained as NCOs, which is a pretty high number. And you just think about what Rodney said about where they're moving on to. You know, most of them are moving on to, to uh, uh, better careers in, in uh, investigative units or, or becoming supervisors. But uh, the bulk of them are, are being retained as NCOs. And again, this is not something that, that happens just overnight. These are skills that are built up over time. And, and, and quite frankly, we've seen some people that wanted to be NCOs and you know, maybe they're, they're better off uh, doing something different. So this is, you know, this is a program that I, in May, it's gonna be, if I'm not mistaken, it's gonna be uh, four years. Uh, where we've, we've, we've built it out, uh, not slowly, but uh, we wanted to make sure we had the logistics right, and we want to make sure that we have the right police officers. We want to make sure that we have the right commanding officers in these precincts, districts, and PSA. So this is a, a process over time, and uh, that, that number will, as we move forward, I think it will, uh, it will get a little bit higher. As far but as there's no say. minimum standard amount of time. No, if you for become an NCO, you know, we're, not, we're not asking you to, to, to sign a contract that you stay there for two years. You know, that's, that's not how we operate in the NYPD. And what if we have a person there that's not the person that we want? Or if a person that uh, has taken a, a sergeant's test and maybe is not going to get promoted for three or four years and he wants to spend that, he or she wants to spend that time as an NCO, we want to let them. Uh, let them do that. So right, we, but I, and I don't disagree with people moving up, up the ladder, but I, I find it troubling that communities can get to know NCOs for perhaps five months or so, five months, sorry, I'm just throwing it out there, not saying it's factual, and then they're moving on. So how are you building um, real trust with communities if after five months to a year or 15 months, NCOs are gone and promoted. If so get, all that trust right, that was built. Right. If, I, if I get two years out of an NCO and they're, they're, they're here, she look, it's looking to do something different within the police department, then uh, that's, I think that's time well spent. If it's, five, if it's five months, then I'm not happy with that. And right. We're trying to minimize that. So the question is, why can't we get to a specific standard on minimal time, a minimum time of two years? Otherwise. Because there has to be flexibility. If I take a sergeant's test, and I'm on the list, and my list number comes up in a year and a half. I have, you know, I'm not going to defer. So to maybe a sergeant. you should, right. So maybe you wouldn't apply to be an NCO if that's the case. Then I mean, there, there has to be some standard put in place, and I think we're just looking for a little bit more consistency. The program is working well. I want to compliment you. I just was at two build it block meetings last week, um, and not my community certainly has built out trust with the 105th NCOs, um, but. If they left in five months, you know, I think that would be a problem. Let me move and, on and because I, I know my... And I, and I agree with you. Five yeah. months is not yeah. what we're looking for. Right. Um, let's move on to slide two. And then I just have one more slide, and then I'm going to get to my colleagues, and I'll come back for a second round. I want to talk about sex crimes for, for a minute. So the city has 
uh, seen a decrease in crime statistics in many other areas. However, sex crimes are on the rise. Rape, felony, sex crimes, and misdemeanor sex crimes all went up in 2018. And year to date, many categories of sex crimes are even higher in 2019 than in 2018. How is the department resource, resources wise handling the increase in sex crimes? And can you speak to, uh, I know DOI recommended assigning more detectives to SVD. How many detectives are in SVD now and do you recommend increasing the staffing being that this is an area that uh, we continue to continuously see uh, increases in? Good morning, uh, Chief Shade, Chief of Detectives. So beginning last year, roughly February of last year, around the time of the IG report, uh, before and after that, there was a series of uh, personnel additions to the Special Victims Division. That has essentially continued through as recently as within the last month, there was 35 uh, police officers transferred into the Special Victims Division. To the question of the current staffing, uh, the most recent staffing within the Special Vi Victims Division, detectives and police officers, uh, is standing at 258 uh, investigators, and that makes up detectives and police officers. Again, there's been a conscious uh, assessment over the last, I would say, 12 months, which has resulted in increased personnel to special victims and, and caseloads decreasing, which is a trend that we wanted to see, and we, we stated last year that we were committed. Uh, over the last 12 months, we've maintained uh, close relationships with the advocate communities. Councilwoman Rosenthal, several meetings. Uh, these are not meetings that are on a, a, a calendar. This is just an ongoing process. We've had people come out to our future sites to view and work with them, uh, taking, taking their insight into these. And, and this is, uh, overall, there, there remains work to be done, but I'm, I'm quite proud of the work of the men and women and special victims over the last 12 months and before and the relationships forged with uh, uh, sex crime survivors as well as the advocate community. And what are the average um, time, caseloads, times to close cases and training requirements, if you can go through that? Well, there is no, the, the first part, there, there is no average case closure. Um, and there's a very important reason for that because when you, we have set a standard that I think uh, people nationally are looking at that uh, we, we advocate and we believe that these cases will progress at the speed uh, that the, the survivors of the sex crimes want to proceed. So we have cases that are initiated, people step out of that process, and we give them the opportunity to step out of that process at any time and then come back into the process if they want to proceed. So it is truly a, a unique crime in that respect. And then therefore measuring the length of time of these investigations, it, it, it would really be very difficult in that respect. But I'm finding it hard. So you don't track specific timeline of cases closed or cl cases opened. Uh, and I ask that question because how do you know you have enough resources if you're not tracking Sure. Uh, and I'm not saying, and I, I definitely get the sensitivity around yep. each case is certainly different, and I'm not telling you to put a time stamp on each individual case, but how do you know you have the resources necessary? And if we're seeing this steep increase continuously and we're not adding the necessary resources um, to ensure, and I'm not, and I commend you for adding some, um, but we're not where we need to be if, if, if we can't keep up with the current caseload. So my, my worry is that you have detectives who are being overworked, um, who can't specifically deal intimately with cases because for every case they move, perhaps they're seeing 20 more cases added to their yep. caseloads. Um, so if we're saying we're taking this issue seriously, how could we not measure metrics? No, we are, we are certainly, that was probably my mistake in, in not being clear enough. We're certainly measuring uh, all, of, all of the above metrics. We can come out with uh, lengths of time a case is open. What I meant to impress upon uh, the council is that we don't simply use that length of time as a measurement of success or not. Agreed. Yeah, so. Agreed you shouldn't, but yeah. 
So you are keeping metric. Yeah, and, and the caseload uh, of the rape complaints, of the uh, sex crime complaints, when you look at uh, what the subject of that hearing last year, are all going in the right direction. Caseloads per investigator are being reduced and continue to be reduced, even with the increase in sex crime complaints. Currently, we're sitting at about a 6.5% increase in rape complaints this year. Right. And I'm trying to get to, and I, this is the question I think we're skipping around, how much average time is spent on a specific case? So there's, you're not measuring that? Uh, we can try to get back to you with an average time per case again, but um, there, there is no two sex crime cases alike due to the, the victims, due to the survivor's statements, how they want to go forward, et cetera. We can try to get you a length of time from inception of case created till it's closed, but again, even how they're closed uh, is fairly unique in, in what we see in other crimes that we investigate. Right, and I get that. I don't yeah, get, Mr. You get Mr. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I, I get what you're driving at, too. I mean, this is why we have sergeants and lieutenants and uh, supervisors in the special victim squad. They carefully look at, at caseload, open and closed, and what time it takes to open and close certain cases. And if cases are open too long, then the supervisors interject themselves in there to see why. And it, as Dermot uh, explained, there, there are many reasons why some cases continue on longer than others. But as far as caseload, we're, we're on top of that each and every day. Okay, we wanna see numbers on that. And let's go through facilities quick. And I did see that you budgeted capital funding this year um, for new SVD facilities. Can you just go through um, what, where we're at with facilities, new facilities? Sure. So. Um, the money you see reflected in the budget is for a new Manhattan Special Victims Facility. We ultimately are taking, for now, one floor in 137 Center Street. Um, we are remodeling that, again, looking at the DOI report, recommendations there. Uh, and we plan to open that facility in June, the end of June of this year. Um, in addition to the work that you see funded in Manhattan, we are um, we have done a renovation in Brooklyn. Um, in the current location at Brooklyn, we've done a renovation in the current location at the Bronx. Um, we ultimately will have both of those facilities, facilities fully remodeled um, over the next two to three weeks. Um, there are improvements that you will see in Brooklyn and the Bronx, I think fairly significant improvements that deal with some of the DOI recommendations, what we can't accomplish in the current locations in those two boroughs. Um, as well as the borough of Queens would be co-location with the DAs and the advocates. So at the same time as we have been working on those renovations, we're working with DCAS in the hopes of obtaining new facilities for those three boroughs. In Staten Island, um, we were in the best shape of, of all the boroughs to start with. Um, we are taking the facility that we currently have and we're acquiring some additional space in that facility. Um, we're going to begin construction in April and wrap up that construction before the end of the year in 2019. And once we do that, we'll be in full compliance in Staten Island with all of the recommendations in the DOI report, as well as have achieved co-location with the DAs and the advocates because that was already in existence in that building. So we're looking to do the same in the other four boroughs. In Manhattan, there is an opportunity to gain more space at 137 Center. We're working with DCAS on that. But again, in the other three boroughs, we would ultimately need new facilities. And so DCAS is doing a site search uh, to try to find a location that would work for both our offices as well as the DAs. And let me just, uh, last question on uh, SVD stuff, and I know Helena have more questions on it. Um, so when Chief Harrison took over, there was a unit uh, reviewing old cases, um, and that was discontinued when she uh, took the helm. Where are we at with those old cases? Who's reviewing those specific cases now? So, so there was a number of moves and an assessment done uh, both before and after Chief Harrison took place. Uh, we had historically a unit in place uh, that worked primarily off DNA-related older cases. Uh, that was necessitated when some years back, and I'm going back a number of years, there was a historical backlog of rape kits in New York City uh, that were tested. 
That, that team that works off those old cases recently cleared that entire backlog. So we were able to repurpose that team for the uh, other team that was uh, ready to start. So essentially, the work is being done. It's being repurposed from a, a, an existing team. And can you give me what that backlog was? So justice was served in all of these cases, or, or did we just check? Yeah, so I'm trying to. So essentially, get a this was, and, I, and I'm going back, Councilman, uh, a number of years, excess, I believe, of five years when this significant uh, rape kit backlog was tested in New York City. Many of these cases were working off old historical kits. Uh, no electronic files. That backlog uh, has been cleared, and the detectives and sergeant that worked on that case can now be freed up to work uh, on any other additional older DNA-related cases that come up. So I know those numbers were somewhere in the area around 5,000, if my memory serves me correct of backlog cases. So are we saying, when you say clear, I'm, can you just define what these yeah, I, cases I do, I do not what have that, that number. I'm not sure if we're speaking of the same thing. Um, but cleared, worked through, and ascertained. This, this team was in existence for years. Um, DNA hits coming back in and of itself does not mean that that person was the uh, perpetrator. Uh, it, it involved numerous trips, interviews of witnesses. So we interviewed all 5,000. I believe my number is somewhere in that area. I'm so not, did we go back and interview all 5,000 of those individuals the, who had backlog cases? The test kits that were done were satisfactorily cleared. I do not know, again, if it was a 5,000 okay. number. All right, I'm gonna, I know Helen will have more questions on that. I just wanna move to the last subject and then I will come back for a round. And it's one of my favorite subjects, Commissioner, as you know, marijuana. And not because I smoke it, but because I think we need justice in this area. Um, so I want to commend you on the um, decrease in um, arrest and summonses uh, around marijuana. And uh, if you, okay, but you got the slide. It's great. Feeling like Wheel of Fortune up here today. Um, and, but when you look at the numbers uh, in the fourth quarter of 2018, we sort of are still in this space where uh, the disparity is still rampant in uh, both arrests and summonses around marijuana. So I'll just read through uh, based on race. Um, uh, you account for American Indian, two, Asian Pacific Island, 17. Black, 56% of all arrests, 291. Hispanics, 182, which is 35%. Unknown, I guess that's a Martian. I don't know what unknown is. What does that mean? But three arrests there, and that's 1%. And white people, uh, 25 arrests, which is 5% of the total out of the 520. So um, my, I, guess I'm, I guess I have to be blunt. Uh, were there only 25 people in New York City who were white smoking marijuana uh, in the fourth quarter last year, 2018? Um, so I'm still trying to get what is the strategy around addressing, truly addressing these disparities, and what do you perceive to be the reason that these disparities still exist so we are, uh, in communities of color? So if you look at the first quarter of 2019, we've reduced our overall misdemeanor marijuana arrest from 3,563 to 304. That's a decrease of 91.5%, uh, 3,259. So uh, our strategy is to, to continue to decrease uh, marijuana arrest and, uh, and, and use summonses when necessary. And we are still responding to community complaints and we're still responding to uh, 911 complaints and 311 complaints. And I know that's been a, a source of controversy in the past because it's been spread all over the city, but uh, our strategy is to continue to reduce uh, enforcement as far as uh, misdemeanor marijuana arrest. So this is feeling like deja vu again on a 911 and 311. You, know, you also have to acknowledge that this is 92% decrease in, in arrest. I do which acknowledge is, which is that. significant. But um, and if you were, if there's a Daily News article today, actually um, a question and answer portion in it that speaks of a person who's being who 
technically can be deported uh, over two marijuana convictions. So that's why we're so passionate uh, specifically about this issue. Um, but I'm still not hearing how we're going to address these disparities overall um, in the city. And I'm, I'm, I, I agree with that we've lowered the arrest, but the numbers are still showing that disproportionately most of these arrests and summonses are happening in communities of color. So if we just do some loose math, and I'd have to check this after we're done, but uh, last year if we used these same rates, it'd be about 1,800 um, black New Yorkers that were locked up for, uh, for marijuana, and this year it was 180. So uh, we're, we are uh, doing our best to make sure that the disparity continues to decrease, and our major focus of our, uh, our strategy is to reduce these arrests, and we've done so much. Uh, now, uh, burning in public is, is, is a summons. Uh, possession in public is a summons. So um, and we'll continue to work together to identify why these disparities exist, and, and uh, we'll keep you apprised of uh, where we are as far and as And I know we'll have that data based, you know, based on the bills that we pass in the council, but it, it still seems to be that um, you know, our communities are still disproportionately being targeted uh, in this specific area. So we look forward to continued work on in this area, um, but it's just hard to justify. And, and what is your position? Does the NYPD have a position on legalizing marijuana? Do you think? I, I, in my opening statement, I said what my concerns were. We're not taking a position. I'm just telling you what my concerns are, and that's in the opening statement. And your concerns are that 21 year old, people under 21. Well, people under 21 uh, driving under the influence. There's no instant test. And uh, home cultivation. Which right. would be and an can issue. you just go through your concerns on home cultivation? Uh, I think you do recall right. the, uh, the chief the death, up in, right. uh, in, in the Bronx that was uh, killed in an explosion. So right. that's my concern. Right. And we certainly share that concern with you. I don't want to, uh, obviously, we chief were Fahey. very sensitive to that. Um, it, would, it would also be difficult to enforce. And are you looking at any, are there any technologies that you know of that perhaps can address this issue? Have you been approached by any companies or anyone interested in sort of what, looking at this specific to address home cultivation? Issue? No, no, no. And the, you said you're concerned about people uh, smoking Yeah, we driving. have to, it's, we are uh, taking a look at it, but right now the method is to use drug recognition experts and it takes a while to get them up to speed. Okay. And what is your preparation? So let's anticipate that this is legalized in Albany this year. I mean, how far along are you in specifically? In preparing for a drug recognition expert yeah. in the department? I'd have to get that number from Tom Chan from uh, Transportation. Okay. Tom, do you have that? If you don't, we'll get back to the uh, chair. We'll get okay. back to the chair. But time is of the essence, so, yeah. And then who are the experts you're looking right now, they're Right now they're in highway, but we'd have to make sure that they were in all precincts. Okay. All right, I'm going to go to my colleagues, and then I will come back. Um, we're going to go to Councilmember Lanceman, and we're going to put uh, three minutes on the clock because we have a lot of questions, and we'll try to get back to uh, second rounds. Good morning. I want to ask you about um, an article that was written in um, something called The Appeal in December of 2018, and it was titled, Is the NYPD's Special Victims Division Premature Prematurely closing sexual assault cases, which is particularly relevant in light of the slide that showed a staggering and across the board increase in reported sex crimes in the city. And what the article found was, um, again, an extraordinary high number of uh, sexual assault uh, and rape complaints that were deemed to be either uncooperative complainant or unfounded meaning um, a very high number of almost all women who had come to the NYPD alleging that they had been raped um, had had their cases determined to be unfounded. And the numbers were quite, um, quite startling. Uh, in 2014, and this goes back a few years, um, something like 12.5% uh, of all cases assigned to, to the Special Victims Division were marked uh, uncooperative complainant. In, I think, 2015, nearly 19% of the total reported rapes were considered to be 
unfounded, which is a separate category. Queens in particular saw an extraordinary number of rapes in 2015 classified as being unfounded, 27%. The consensus among researchers and law enforcement professionals is that the average number of rapes that might be reported which are untrue are in the low single digits. And by way of example, in Los Angeles, for the period 2014 through 2016, their um, reporting of unfounded rape or sexual assault allegations were less than 3%. Can you tell us what is the percentage of um, rape or sexual assaults that the NYPD deems to be uh, unfounded or um, closes because the witness is uncooperative? Do you keep those statistics? Yeah, we do. And, uh, uh, Dermot will answer the balance of this question, but I will, will state that we are absolutely committed to uh, providing justice for the victims of, uh, uh, the, for the survivors of sexual assault. And we do this in a, a number of ways. We do this in making sure we have enough personnel and special victims. We put new leadership in there, and we also meet with the advocates every three months to make sure that uh, we are doing that in conjunction uh, with the advocates and, and, uh, and the survivors. So Dermot, I don't know if you have those numbers. Yeah, if you, could, if you could give me the current statistics and you could tell us what might account for such an extraordinary high number of uh, unfounded designations coming out of Queens. So you were quoting a, a number of uh, years and statistics there. I will get back to you before the end of today with our current statistics, but I can reiterate what Police Commissioner O'Neill said. Uh, under, under Commissioner, uh, excuse me, under Chief Harrison, uh, we are continuing to work with the advocate community. We've made a number of uh, uh, additions to the unit as a, as a commitment. We've driven the case slowed down. We've taken the uh, recommendations at times. Uh, we've had set up processes where uh, rape survivors with advocates review the cases, and I can tell you that the, the, the feedback has been extremely positive that we've received from the rape advocates as well as rape survivors. Uh, two specific cases in a borough well, five years ago, we will have to get back to you, but uh, it is a very low number Councilman of unfounded cases uh, in, in the rape category. So you'll be able to get us that information today. I mean, listen, if you told me you got it to me by the end of the week, that'd be okay also. But you'll, you'll get us the data. We the will get you for 2018 what we closed, any rape c case mm -hmm. by the end of today. Okay. And, and the closed separated by... I guess there's an unfounded designation. Whether there's it's a arrest, um, unfounded. And I'm going to tell you that unfounded it will be a very small number. Okay. Okay. Good. And you'll break it down by borough because there seems to be a discrepancy or a, a variance based on borough. Sure. Okay. But, great. but again, some of those numbers you were quoting, I th if I heard correctly, true. Five some were years 2014, ago. 2015. Yeah. If we were in a different place now, that yeah, that's and, great. and that's the good news that the the work that has been done over the last years, uh, some of it started by the former chief, continued certainly, and with the current chief to work with the advocates, to work with the sex crime survivors, to hear their concerns. Uh, and, I, and I think that that's why what puts me in a, a very comfortable place today to say that I am confident and quite proud of the work of our Special Victims Division. All right, great. Sure. I have a, a marijuana question. Gonna, we'll get gonna, to in round two. Uh, yeah, we're going to get back. I'm going to go to Cohen, Brannon, then Ballone. Uh, thank you, Chair Richards. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. I know I buttonholed you before the, the hearing started, but I just want to go on record briefly on two issues of local concern that I'm very concerned about. Uh, one are the staffing levels at the 5 precinct. Uh, I am pleased uh, that, you've, uh, that we're going to get five officers out of the April class, but I am really concerned that I, th I still think that the staffing levels there are, are very low between uh, maternity leave, vacation, sick. Uh, I just don't think that the staffing levels are adequate there for the, you know, they work very hard, and I, I know it's not, you know, that people aren't, you know, the murder is not the number one problem in the 5-0. But there really are a significant number of quality of crimes, uh, larceny, grand larceny. So, I, I think that we do that the staffing levels are are low there. I'd appreciate it if you look at them again. 
uh, and two, the, the, the physical condition of the 5-2 precinct. I know you're familiar with it, that it's a very old precinct. Uh, you know, again, the men and women who work in that precinct work very, very hard, and the conditions there I just don't think are conducive to a professional uh, police department in New York City in 2019. So, and, and I know, I think the facilities is actually coming up to look at, at the precinct with me. So, uh, and that's thanks also to the hard work of Oleg. Oleg and I have been communicating well together, so I want you to know so, that. So, uh, Vinny will probably take the second part of that uh, question about the 5-2, but just looking at the 5-0, and I'm looking at my, uh, my smartphone here. We have nine, nine uh, sectors out there right now, and that's due to neighborhood policing. That's much, you'll see that's much more than prior to neighborhood policing, but uh, maybe at some point you can sit down with Jack Donahue, our Chief of Strategic Initiatives, and, and he'll walk through you how we determine the number of officers uh, in each precinct. So we'll, we'll do that, and we'll take a look at the July class for you, too. I appreciate that okay. very much. Uh, you know, I was uh, struck in your testimony about uh, that of the expense budget that 92 percent is PS. Do you have any sense of how that relates, compares to other big cities? Uh, is, is all, you know, 92 percent of the money you get goes to salary? Yeah, I think well, there's a couple of things here. So I, I have not, I can't say we've looked at other cities. I mean, obviously, the size of the police force here, um, that, that is a huge driver in that cost. Um, when we look at OTPS, though, what you have to look at is there is the city tax levy budget. Um, and then we would not, I mean, frankly, we would not be able to survive if those were the only funds we had. Uh, to support the costs of the department. We are signif we're significantly relying on federal Homeland Security grants um, as a stream of money that supports our counterterrorism efforts. So those funds supplement our OTPS budget. Um, you know, ultimately, every year on the OTPS side is a challenge because of the size of the organization that we're managing. Um, but again, those Homeland Security grant funds are a significant piece of what helps us maintain the operations on the OTPS side. Uh, and you talked about fare evasion in, in your testimony. I don't know what our strategy is around fare evasion now. I know I have, you know, I have two MTA board members who are constituents who talk to me about the issue, but I'm not really sure what our strategy is. Could you talk about that a little bit for a second? Yeah, Ed Delatory, and then uh, I'll add to the, his comments. Okay, good morning again. All right, so the fare evasion uh, situation in transit is, is somewhat complex, and I'm going to go through it step by step. Um, one of our strategies is with the rollout of neighborhood policing. I'll talk faster. With the rollout of neighborhood policing, is that a little faster? Um, you can go over we, to neighborhoods again. <laughs> yeah, your steps can be, so, we could be here. So I'm going to give you an example of, of what we're seeing, <laughs> because we, we're engaged in several pilots with transit, I'll give you the pilots real quick. One pilot is, if you've noticed, all 472 stations now have fare evasion warning signs with a stop sign planted right next to the gate so people who are hurting through the gates get that last minute to reconsider what they're doing. Uh, we also have a pilot we're rolling out now in 10 stations where we're putting very large signage in front of the turnstiles and the gates on the ground so that, once again, people get a chance to stop, look, and get a second uh, and think twice about it. We also have an additional pilot we're working on right now where we've turned on the alarms again. They were turned off a couple of years back. In 10 stations, we've turned on the alarms. We're working with the Marin Institute in NYU who are going to assess these pilots at the end. So what we're looking at is compliance, not money, and I'll tell you why. Um, we've also got the NCOs working with the group station managers, like I told you, so when we get complaints, and when I told you about that handheld uh, device you use on a train, we get complaints through the portal, the MTA portal. We get the direct emails to us, to the NCOs, about problematic stations. So, for instance, Flushing Main Street, we did an operation at the end of last year. Uh, we then did another operation. When I say operation, I send out a larger amount of officers, and we try to go through the high evasion time of day, and we'll just grab as many people as we can going through the gate and bring them to the side. Um, so these operations we've done in several stations, 125th and St. Nick's, Flushing Main Street, and a few others to support the NCOs. I'm going to give you the number now. 572 people in these operations were apprehended going through the gate. Of the 572, we wrote 147 tab summonses. We wrote three criminal court summonses. We arrested one person. 421 were warned and instructed. But 
The interesting part is the 421 who were warned and instructed, 309 were students and 112 were elderly who otherwise have a half price Metro card anyway. So we warn them because there is a compliance issue, there's a behavioral issue here, and it's not always the theft of service itself. These students have Metro cards, they're not using it. So all these pilots we're undertaking right now are pilots to see if we can change behavior at the turnstile and get support through technology to help us correct this behavior. Thank Ch you. Chair, uh, we didn't even touch upon uh, buses. I'd like to uh, uh, you know, in, in the next round. Okay. Um, uh, so uh, thank so you very I'll come much. Back. I'm going to go to Brannon and Valone and Menchaca. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. NCO program is working very, very well in uh, the districts I cover, so I, I thank you for that. Um, I have to bring up something that I actually saw on Twitter. Um, I know that the state troopers have increased their presence in the city. In many cases, they're working side by side with the NYPD. There's a tweet here that NYPD News retweeted in fe February 7th. Um, and it's, it says, it's a, it's a picture of a uh, state trooper car and a cop car right by the Brooklyn Bridge. It says, one mission, one team, partners in public safety. Um, would you agree that while they might have the same mission, that the New York City cops are taking on way more responsibilities in the city than their state counterparts, the troopers? Yet, I don't think I'd read too much into that statement. They are deployed at bridges, tunnels, um, and some other areas of the city. I think they're in uh, Grand Central and Penn Station, too. Uh, they're that, and that one mission is to keep New Yorkers safe. That's, that's what that tweet is. I think uh, um, we've, we've been in partnership uh, with the state troopers for a long time. I know they've increased their presence a lot over the years, but uh, that's not something I'm going to resist. I think uh, to have, uh, if you look at highway deaths the last year, uh, they're down considerably, and that's with the assistance of the New York State troopers. Is, there, is, is it on your radar, is it a priority for you to get city cops a fair market rate of pay that's competitive with trooper pay? Because I think what I'm hearing from guys on the job is when we're standing shoulder to shoulder with the troopers, when they're getting paid much more than city cops, it's it's a partnership, but, but one, one guy's getting paid much more than the other guy. Yeah. So, you know, I've, I've been in this business for a long time, and I think you know that, and um, I'm always advocating uh, to make sure that we're able to retain our highly trained, effective uh, police department, and uh, we do that to make sure that they're, they're being paid correctly. Uh, and I know they're in, uh, uh, in the uh, contract negotiation process. I don't want to say anything to interfere with that, but uh, these, this is just take a look at how this city's been transformed over the last 25, 29 years, and it's, it's, not because, it's not because it was magic. A lot of hard work, a lot of sacrifice, a lot of people, uh, police officers injured and killed in the line of duty. So, you know, anything that I can do and say to, to help this process move forward and make sure our police officers are prom uh, compensated properly, um, I'll assist in that matter. Uh, Commissioner, I appreciate that. I mean, I, I want to offer the council as a partner to the police department in trying to get that done. I mean, the city is certainly, um, since I've been a kid, I mean, it's night and day. Um, I'm just trying to get these guys to, to get paid what, what I think they deserve to get paid. So I yep. offer you the yep. council as, as a partner in that. Yep, the men and women of the NYPD need to be paid at a competitive rate. I agree. Thank, Thank you. you. Going to Councilmember Vallone, then Menchaca. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, Commissioner. First and foremost, thank you on behalf of every man and woman that puts on the uniform. Uh, as a husband and a father, we always start with that precedent. This, the city is where it is today because of the hard work of the men and women of the NYPD. So I thank you for that. Um, and continuing Councilmember Brennan's wishes that we stand with you, um, just to highlight that over 35 council members have signed that letter in support. So we will fight for you and each member to get that pay raise and fair equity. Um, today we stood on the steps of City Hall to make sure that you saw that unity and that the administration saw that also. I believe in a $91 billion budget we can do that for the members of the NYPD. Um, that is something we're proud to do. I know I will always do that. So you have our support with that. And one of the things that I would like to work with you on going forward is one of the hearings that we held in the past here was a package of almost a dozen pieces of, 
legislation focused on school safety. Uh, to me, our children are always the future, and protecting them is first and foremost and paramount. Uh, what I would like to do is move forward with that legislation, but we're still waiting for the memorandum of understanding to be released, updated, and given by the NYPD. What I would like to ask for you today is to see if we can get an update on that status so we can move forward with that legislation so that we can put the advocates at rest who are telling us that school safety should not be something that's a priority. In my eyes, I will gl gladly debate or take on anyone who tells me that school safety should not t be a top priority. So I'd like to see if yep. we have any update on that release. Yeah, Chief Hoffman, Nilda Hoffman from uh, Community Thank Affairs you. will give you an update. Good morning, Hi, Chief. Hi good morning. Just, um, I just want to affirm, first of all, that um, currently there is a MOU that's been in, in place for over 20 years, and the NYPD is committed to the safety of every day of our schools. The MOU, the current status is, we're done with the MOU and the NYPD, so it's currently in the possession of DOE. And that's one of our fights also, obviously with DOE. I'd ask this simple question. Would you feel that a school that has a camera is more safe than a school that doesn't have a camera? Yes, I do. And that has been my premise from day one, and I will gladly take that debate with anyone. I'm trying to bring parity and equality to every school so that they do have a camera and they do have the basic means for protection. I'm not really caring about disciplinary rules in schools. That's something separate, and that's what the task force is forward on now. So I want to support you and the NYPD to get those tools for these schools, because every time we have an, a, a, a public hearing, on shooter preparation and school safety. It is attended by every principal, every teacher who is saying thank you for that. Please help us have the resources. So I want you to know I have your back and I want to fight for that. So if we can get that memorandum and work with DOE, we will fight for that. Thank you very thank much, you. Chair. Thank you, Councilwoman Menchaca. Followed by Menchaca, we'll go to Deutsch and then Powers. Menchaca is gone. Okay, so we're going to go to Deutsch, then Powers. Thank you. Um, good morning. Good morning, Commissioner. Um, so first, I just want to um, uh, we'll start with, with a quick question. We just had a rally earlier today uh, to support market pay for New York City police officers to be up to par with other states. Uh, do you support fair market uh, pay uh, for um, the NYPD officers? Right, are you asking me if I support whether or not uh, men and women in the New York City Police Department should their pay should be competitive. Yeah, I, I don't want to lose people to other police departments just because they're not getting paid enough. I thank guess. you. Um, thank you very much. Um, now, secondly, um, since I have three minutes, after learning um, of a high recidivist rate of sexual offenders in our subway systems, I immediately submitted the bill in the city council for a lifetime ban, and I'm going to see where that goes. But according to news reports, it states that police sources on the front lines of the fight against sex crimes say that they have been pushing for a lifetime ban for serial offenders for years. Um, can, can anyone, can, can you confirm that? Um, and if yes, where, where is the NYPD holding uh, with that? Yeah, uh, Chief Delatore, I'll walk you through the history. Sure, thank you. Might be a long one, but <coughs> history. Yeah, so. Okay. Well, my, yeah. <laughs> okay. This is my one cup of coffee speed. I'd have to have another. I want to put you on a timer. <laughs> All right. All right. So, uh, so yeah, th this conversation has been going on. I was involved in a conversation with, with the MTA about 15, 16 years ago on this matter. Um, it has been going on for some time. Uh, walking through the process, we, we know that we have these sexual predators. They are misdemeanors for the most part, except for unlawful surveillance. Uh, one thing I think where the city council might be able to help us is to enact some uh, legislation that says after the second, third, fourth, you know, whatever level you want to go to, that this misdemeanor becomes a felony, uh, just like drunk driving. Um, we do, uh, in our normal course of uh, doing business in transit, we make sure our officers know the recidivist offenders well, uh, uniform, typically a uniform officer will spot a recidivist offender, radio, radio over for plainclothes teams. They will respond out and try to intercept the offender and follow the offender. I think the really sad part of all of this is that we know what they're there to do, and most of the time when we're following them, they do commit the crime again. We have to watch and wait until they find their victim, 
we have to wait until they victimize their victim before we can go in and arrest them again. We take other steps. We work with, we have a special victim squad dedicated to transit in a special victims unit. They come out and enhance the arrest. We, do, we have a victim impact statement that's made out by the victim so that when the case goes forward, you know, the DA has not only, you know, what we observe, but the feelings of the victim as well. Um, and we take a lot of other steps to try and ensure that these people do get prosecuted. But again, we're talking about a misdemeanor. And, uh, and not every judge treats it the same. So we do what we can to equip the district attorneys with everything they need to really make a strong case and keep these people out of the system for a while. So if someone commits, uh, it says uh, um, in one of uh, Roger Reed, he, he includes 20 sex crime busts. So if each one is a misdemeanor, so the person, according to you, is still permitted to go back into the subway, even though there's 20 misdemeanors. For, for forcibly touching or, um, uh, or uh, rubbing against? Um yes, yes. They molest women, they molest men, they molest children, and they were allowed back into the system. Okay, so I just, I want to have a conversation with you maybe uh, offline and to see how we could uh, push this to, to do a total um, lifetime ban. Does the police department support that? I do. <laughs> I, would, I, would, I would say they should be banned and they okay. should be given the opportunity to have the ban lifted provided they get the appropriate help. Can the police commissioner speak now? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. yes I, I support the ban. You support it. Okay. So I'd love to um, have an offline conversation with the police commissioner. And if you want to come into the conversation, Chief, you could, you're welcome. That's, that's up to the commissioner. But I think that every single day that passes that someone is traumatized, and especially young children, and I'm reading uh, as young as nine years old, um, you know, many of us, I have five children, two grandchildren of my own, and I would not um, want, you know, someone, forget my, not, not only my own child, but any child or any individual should be um, molested on a train going or coming from work. Uh, that's totally unacceptable. So I would like to have a conversation with the police commissioner and to see how we can do it to further pursue this. And if we need to get the state legislators involved and the district attorneys, um, I think this should be like a, um, a priority because uh, we know that the trains are a target for these sexual offenders, just like uh, playgrounds may be a target for pedophiles or schools. Uh, is a target for pedophiles, so I'd love to work with you on this, com uh, Commissioner. Look forward to it. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, we're going to go to Powers, then Rosenthal. Thank you. Thank you for the testimony. Thank you all for being here today. And I just want to first comment by saying that I have uh, an unbelievable uh, precincts and CEOs and cops in my in my district, the 13th, the 17th, and 19th, and Midtown uh, South, Midtown North. So I want to thank the entire department for their work, and I just point out how great and lucky I am about the folks that work in my district. Um, I have met family members and and friends who are who are cops, members of the department, or, or retired, and um, I so I, sh I want to just echo the sentiment here about pay and and obviously about benefits as well to those who put their lives on the line for us and for serve our city every day um, and I this is not a new issue obviously it goes way back I had friends who started on the force when they were making $25,000 a year or I think even lower um, at that point I remember there was a debate between Commissioner Kelly and um, and Mayor Bloomberg at the time uh, particularly as they were having trouble recruiting people into the Academy which is just two blocks from where I live around um, pattern bargaining and whether it was working or not in terms of the police department and there was a disagreement. I want to see if uh, you had sh any sort of, do you share the sentiment from Commissioner Kelly around pattern bargaining and whether it's working or not in regard to the, the pay for the, P, uh, for the yeah, cops? So the I, I do the hold the other uniform services in very high regard, but I think the work that the NYPD does is different. So um, I don't fully understand pattern bargaining. I've been a commissioner for two and a half years now. I think that our job is different and it has to be looked at differently. Got it. Appreciate that. Um, and um, 
The, uh, the, the, the follow-up thing I say is I think we do ask a lot more these days in terms of uh, all those who serve on the force, and so that it, it is, it's not unreasonable to ask them to also be paid, you know, as we ask them to do more for the job. But thank you for that. Um, second, I want to ask, uh, we're in the middle of a conversation around the city charter and about, there's, we're going to hear from the CCRB and others about ideas they have in terms of uh, oversight and budgeting. I was wondering if the department had any uh, recommendations in, in terms of the city charter around um, uh, improvements to the city charter around policing. Uh, uh, we, we did look at the, uh, the changes, the proposed changes to the city charter, and one of them was granting subpoena powers to the CCRB's highest ranking staff. Uh, we don't have an objection to subpoena signatory authority being expanded to include the executive director of the CCRB in connection with cases where there's an active CCRB investigation. I think that would uh, uh, help us move these cases forward rather quickly. As far as their budget being tied to our budget, uh, I mean, it's, it's a separate agency and uh, it's unique to CCRB and that should be the basis for their budget and not factors unique to the NYPD. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I, I'll cede my time back to the chair. Thank you for all 14 seconds leadership. We're going to go to Rosenthal and Gibson. Thanks so much. Good afternoon. Um, I want to circle back to the cold cases issue with SVD. Uh, it was a little disconcerting to hear that they had all been closed. Um, so I'd like you to clarify that a little bit. It's my understanding from the advocates that there were 8,000 open cases in January of this year. 150 had DNA hits. So I want you to please clarify, have those 150 been closed? And have they been closed with a resolution that you found the perpetrator? Mm -hmm. And what happened with the other 7,850 7, cases? Let me explain why it's so important for us not to be flip about this. These are people who are waiting to hear whether or not they get justice. And, you know, Commissioner, you were so wonderful around solving the uh, uh, Prospect Park case. That was a cold case that, that some of your investigators dogged for years and successfully closed. So are you saying that those numbers you gave, that all your cold cases are closed? Okay, so to answer the question, I'm gonna take a step back so everyone is on, on the same page. As I, as I said earlier, a number of years ago, there was a move to test rape kits that yeah, had never- Yeah, that's not what I'm talking about. But, it, but it's, it'll help clarity I, for I'm everyone I'm on the, in the clock room. for three minutes. I'm talking about January 2019. 8,000 cold cases, yes or no? Are they closed or not? I do not have a number of, I heard earlier, 5,000 and 8,000. What I can tell you is there was a significant- Helen back, is right. Significant backlog of cases okay. that was Let's worked through. Okay, let's go on to the next thing because I really have a limited amount of time. I'm not talking about five years ago or 10 years ago. I'm talking about this year. Okay, but I'm trying to answer and the question. And it sounds like you don't have the answer and you can get back to me. It's really okay. I, I think it was just a misstatement. Okay. Um, in 2018, according to the data that you put on the, uh, your website because of the new law that you need to report on the number of detectives in SVD, I see a total of 226. And I'm wondering, um, one of the things which was 105 in adult squad, and 62 in child abuse. Um, recently we sat down and you gave a number that I'm forgetting right now, is roughly the same or a little bit higher, which is great. Um, but 80, in the, and that, in the numbers that you gave, this will be my last question, Chair. In the numbers that you gave in the report uh, for the end of 2018, there were 48 white shields and the number we heard uh, this past week or so was 80 white shields. So I'm just wondering what's going on there with the white shields and also wondering, you know, our big concern is that we're taking from the child squad, 
where the numbers dip down in the number of detectives in order to move them over to the adult squad because the focus last year was really on the adult squad. And the goal was to get that number up to 120. And my concern is that we sort of rob Peter to pay Paul. Um, and friend. nothing personal. <laughs> and um, you know, I'm seeing here that for 2018, the adult squad is 100, which means you drop down from 120 down to 100. And that was your last big announcement, was that it was 120. My point is, these numbers are going around, all around the place. I'm really concerned that we're not getting to the staffing levels that the DOI called for. Well, I'll just say that whether it's staffing or the cold cases, uh, we've met a number of times, Councilwoman, uh, including with the advocates, without the advocates. I'd be happy to sit down and iron out any numbers again. The 8,000 number, um, you said it came from the advocates. We do not have that number. So that's, it's not a question of not answering. I just, that number to me in front of me does not exist, but I'd be happy to talk about it. Thank you. Cold cases, but not for the number of detectives or white shields. And, and in terms of the white shields and, de and detectives, um, I'm looking at the, this is as of December 31st, what you were quoting before. Uh, I think we've consistently, I agree with you, the last thing we want to do is rob Peter to pay Paul. Um, not that there has never been somebody that has gone from one um, squad to the other, child to I adult, to back and forth. I think the number was around 14. That uh, right after the DOI, the hearing that we had, it was 14 detectives that were switched up. I, I think if you look at special victims, and this is okay. the most important Thank you. Uh, impression I'll leave you with, we, in the last 12 months, we have consistently uh, made an effort to add resources in terms of uh, additional investigators to special victims. It is at a point that they have never before had this number of investigators, which I think is a positive. Thank you. I'll come back around. All right. Thank you, Councilmember Gibson. And happy birthday to Councilmember Gibson today. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Um, to you and the executive team here and all of the mem members of the department, thank you for being here. And I certainly, even on my birthday, it was important for me to be here, so I'm here. Um, but I wanted to just echo the sentiments of all of my colleagues that talked about supporting the department and raising the uh, salary so that it could be comparable to other law enforcement. We have a great amount of respect for all of the men and women of the department, and certainly whatever this city council can do to help support those efforts, we certainly will do. Um, so I want to thank you for that. And you know, I always have a ton of questions, so I'm just going to push them all out and then I'll allow you guys to answer. But there is a slide that I wanted uh, to put up as it relates to overtime. Um, a few years ago, we put in an overtime cost control plan of $50 million, and I believe that we've been working on that each and every year. And I wanted to understand what future projections are. I know our chair talked about the PEG, uh, which is a $53 million uh, cost savings the department has to achieve. So I wanted to understand the current FY19 budget for civilian overtime is about $83 million, and we are already at $86 million in civilian overtime, and the uniform FY19 budget is about $546 million, and we're at $383 million, which is about 70% through February. Um, and so if we keep pace with these numbers, we're going to exceed what our projected amounts are in both civilian as well as um, uniformed overtime. So I wanted to understand what the plans are for that. I wanted to ask if there is an update on the crisis intervention training, which I know we accelerated uh, $5.3 million, so I wanted to find out where we are with that. Um, we have seen a number of uh, emotionally disturbed persons, EDP calls increase, and I wanted to ask about my favorite part of the department, the 911 call takers, and where we are with our budgeted headcount. Do we have any vacancies, and how are we doing with our 911 call takers? I also wanted to get an update on Rodman's neck uh, in the Bronx, $155 million. I wanted to get an update on the 4-0 precinct, where we are with that. 
Um, also a huge fan. I've talked so much and we've done a lot of work around school crossing guards. And I wanted to find out how we are doing with the hiring and the retention and if we've identified any vacancies and what we're doing to address that. Um, there was a time when Susan Herman was with the department. We talked about mental health diversion centers. So I wanted to see if we had an update in that. And finally, I wanted to ask about the school safety NCO program and how we're doing with that rollout. All right, so you're not going to answer all those questions because I know the commissioner has to go. But let's get to the overtime and then we can, can do we a, did, a uh, briefing on the side. We did CIT Thank already. You. We'll, we'll, uh, yeah. we'll brief you afterwards about CIT. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Okay. So the overtime budget, the, one of the problems with, we, we looked at the numbers in the city council report. And when you look at the, um, that's a total overtime, civilian and uniform. But one of the things that uh, we saw in the city council report um, understand that our, our uniformed overtime budget, which is what you've heard publicly, we talk about a uniformed overtime cap. Um, when you look at our city funded uh, overtime, that does not include grant funds, which we use for our counterterrorism overtime, as well as revenues and reimbursables. So just looking at fiscal 18, so we're clear, um, the total spend on the uniform side was 589.3 million. Um, we have 84.7 million that comes in as grants or reimbursables. So that increases the city funded budget of 506 million for fiscal 18. And because we had uh, of, uh, uh, expenditures that were essentially 1.6 million less. So in the grand scheme of things, 600 million in total overtime, we came in 1.6 million under in uniformed overtime, that overtime cap. Looking at fiscal 19, uh, you're correct in seeing that we have um, more, ex more expenditures in fiscal 19 than we had in fiscal 18. There are a couple of drivers on the uniform side. One of them is body-worn camera training. So as we accelerated the body-worn camera program, we are forced to train officers on overtime because ultimately if we didn't do that, um, we'd be pulling too many officers off of patrol and we'd have an impact on our patrol strength. So we have an expenditure of approximately six million for body-worn camera overtime. We had $6 million that, that during the course of the year have gone specifically to dealing with uh, crime fighting, and this is something that we call uh, our crime violence reduction over time. That has been funded in years past, is not funded this year. So all in all, that's another $6 million, and we look at uh, our risk here in terms of our current spend is in the ballpark of about $15 million. but we've done a number of things. Um, we've implemented a number of programs to attempt to reduce non-essential overtime that we hope will bring us closer to that uniform overtime budget. So that's where we stand on the uniform side. The civilian side, just to, again, to, to make sure we're comparing apples to apples, one of the challenges over there um, is when you look at our city fund funded budget at the beginning of the year, um, school safety, the overtime we use to fund school safety is not uh, fully funded in that budget, but at the end of the year, the DOE reimburses us. So there's about 15 million in expenditures on the school safety side, that if you look at our budget versus our spend, it doesn't come into the budget till the end of the year. And then there's about six to eight million dollars on the traffic enforcement side, um, where we're doing overtime for different construction projects, and we ultimately get that money reimbursed. So we do have a deficit on the civilian side, but it's smaller than what uh, you are projecting when you look at these numbers. Um, ultimately, the civilian deficit will range in the 25 million area, and it's largely due to covering shortages in, in some of our civilian titles where we have vacancies. So most, in most years, we cover that um, with a PS surplus that comes from our vacancy rate. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, all righty, I know Councilmember Miller. Just before we get to Councilmember Miller, I had a question on, um, so on discipline. So how many of the discipline review panel recommendations have been implemented so far? Uh, so I'll give you, uh, give you an update real quick. So we had 13 recommendations that were made. Um, three are totally complete and then the rest are on track 
and, and being followed up by the, the various members of the committee and their subcommittees. You said uh, three have been implemented? Yeah, so I'll tell you, uh, just give you a sense. So we, if you're talking about, we can start with the support for revisions to 50A, which is, as you know, has been an ongoing conversation. Uh, we've been asked uh, at previous council hearings and, and in other ways about our position there. We've made that position uh, very clear with respect to our interest in amending 50A. And the reason for the amendment is to preserve the protections that, that the original legislation was targeted to, to, uh, to provide for our officers. And um, also to achieve, to achieve transparency, uh, you also know that we have been trying to provide uh, information through our website um, and uh, get as close as we can to the line of 50A uh, protections. Um, but provide information that the public would, uh, would be interested in knowing. And so, uh, so we are, as it relates to, to that, we are make, moving in the right direction, we hope, um, and, and are supporting uh, amendments to, to 50A legislation. Um, we also want to do that in the context of not supporting uh, an expansion of 50A. I mean, we don't want to blow it out and have it, have it be more restrictive um, or less restrictive. Uh, we also, uh, on with regard to enhancing public reporting, uh, we, we, we are uh, probably in April, we will be posting, uh, this is data we can provide, it's aggregate data, not specific uh, categories of data, but aggregate data for the last, uh, uh, for 16, uh, calendar year 16, calendar year 17, and calendar year 18. So we'll make that information uh, available. Uh, and of course, the uh, one of the other, uh, issues uh, that were raised by the panel and that we were interested in, in doing uh, is publishing the uh, trial calendar, trial room calendar um, in advance. And so that is now up and running and operating on the website, uh, providing uh, the date of the trials and so forth. And um, the um, hope that was that we would be able to uh, report some of the summary uh, data from the trials, the uh, so-called squibs. Uh, that we intended to make available to the public as well, uh, but we've now been enjoined from doing that uh, permanently uh, by a, a recent decision uh, in, the, uh, in the courts. And then uh, with respect to um, DV, uh, as you know, as we did with uh, driving while intoxicated, we were, um, in that case, we increased penalties uh, to deal with members of the service who were engaged in, in, in driving while intoxicated. We, uh, and we put a system in place uh, increasing those penalties um, in, in a variety of ways, but with a schedule. Uh, we are doing the same thing. Uh, we hope to move in that direction and are moving in that direction with respect to penalties uh, uh, regarding uh, domestic violence cases. And the goal is to, again, enhance those penalties. Uh, we will include, as we have done with uh, uh, DWI, aggravated factors that will increase the penalties depending on the conduct of the, of the individual officers, uh, and, and of course developing a, a structure or matrix that would sort of show you what those penalties uh, look like. Uh, we, are, we are moving in that direction as well. So it's still a work in progress, uh, but um, I think we're very close to, uh, to making that a reality within the next um, uh, month or so. Uh, and. Um, and we will also, I think, which is, these are in two important aspects of, of what we hope to accomplish there, and that is by adding uh, dismissal probation uh, as, as, a, as a viable option, as well as um, mandatory counseling. Uh, we are looking at uh, ways to make sure that even after the case is resolved, and whatever, and whatever the penalties are, that, that we attach um, another requirement that's mandatory, which is counseling for the individuals and we're still trying to work through what that will look like, scoping that out. And Commissioner, can you just speak on these things? Because I know he came, he was at the disciplinary hearing, which was not an easy hearing, and, and we had issues, obviously, around domestic violence and individuals in the service with DUIs and DWIs, and um, we all for second chances, and I think, you know, we, none of us have walked on water our, our entire lives, but we did find uh, major issues with individuals serving in a department who had more than one substantiated case around DV. In some cases, I think three or four or five cases, but still serving, um, you know, as police officers. Um, so, 
as we look to improve police community relations and we talk about building trust um, between the department and the NCO program is a great step in the right direction, but accountability has to also be a part of the conversation. And, um, yeah. you know, we found it alarming that, you know, there were some officers who got a slap on the wrist for DV opposed to people with which you would consider less serious offenses who ended up with deeper penalties. So can you explain the disparities around that and how we're fixing that and how we're going to ensure that uh, there's one rule of law for everyone? You know, in some other jobs, you would be fired on the spot yep. Yep. for a substantiated DV case. So just wanted to get you on the record. Fire, um, firing, on, firing on the spot does become difficult yeah, uh, uh, unless someone is uh, Convicted of, of uh, certain charges, but uh, DV is something that I asked Ben to take a look at a number of months ago, uh, actually prior to the blue panel report, that uh, as I see these cases coming to me, we have to have uh, uh, maybe not zero tolerance, but close enough to zero tolerance, and I do believe in second chances, but uh, in DV cases, uh, I look very harshly on them, and that's why we're looking for an amendment to 50A, not a repeal. We're looking to... Uh, release the officer's name, the command disciplinary charges, trial transcripts, and trial decisions, and final discipline Im imposed. I think that's the only way we're going to continue to build trust with people in New York City to make sure that they can see uh, what our disciplinary system consists of and how, uh, at times, uh, uh, how severe it can be. Right, and then body cameras have, uh, body cameras have been rolled out to everyone? Yep, on, uh, not, uh, on patrol. There are still on about, patrol. I think it's, uh, 4,000 in specialized units that we're looking to put them out to towards the end of the year. Towards the end of the year. So we anticipate all 4,000 right. will have by the end so, of the year. So just so you have that number, there's, so there's currently 20,000 members of the service. Right, who that, have, that have body cameras. cameras. Right. And, right. And, and, and then can you just speak to, uh, and I know we're beginning to wrap up, I think Miller has a question and then we're going to wrap up with Lanceman with one more question. I want to thank you for being patient with us today and uh, having shorter testimony, certainly, and we acknowledge that. Um, how long, uh, so can you just speak to who oversees the body-worn camera program, and how long does it take for you to get footage to, D to the DAs, the CCRB, et cetera, if requested as well? And yeah, is there a particular the first, the first unit? Office, I don't know if Ben wants yeah. to do that or Chief okay. Montilla wants to do that. Yeah, we'll get, we'll get Matt to walk you through it, uh, just to sort of over, over, overlooks it. What was that? Yeah. You want to? You're going to raise. You said CCRB as well. Yeah, CCRB, DAs, and do you have a specific person assigned to deliver that footage? Was the do you track the times? How long it takes to get? Yeah, Matt, can, can let me get you in here so you can walk through the specifics of it. But yeah, we have all of this. There's a whole process in place. Okay. Uh, for making and sure there's a point happens. person who would. Well, we oversee it. Uh, okay. through our office, through Risk Management Bureau. So, um, but there's a, let, let Matt walk you through just where we are and what the process looks like. And what's the total cost that have been spent so far? If that could be thrown in as well, that would be uh, Good morning, Assistant Chief Matthew Pontello from the First Deputy Commissioner's Office. So we have a number of compliance measures in place uh, for uh, monitoring the use of body-worn cameras and a number of follow-up measures uh, to make sure that uh, people are using the cameras as required, uh, and then we have systems in place uh, to uh, uh, ensure that. So to begin, we, our Risk Management Bureau analyzes body camera usage, uh, and to date we have over uh, 3.5 million videos recorded, uh, 20,000 members of the NYPD with cameras. We're averaging about 85,000 videos per week. So it's a huge undertaking uh, to review <clears throat> all of that video. Uh, so we put a number of uh, compliance measures in place. So specifically, uh, we uh, analyze body camera video and, and usage, and we prepare a weekly report that analyzes usage broken down by command. We also track anybody who has no body camera usage in a given period of time, and then require a follow-up investigation as to why that person doesn't have uh, any videos recorded. We also do a, a compliance report where we uh, compare other known data sets, things like arrests and summonses, and then compare that to body camera video 
to make sure that members are complying with the policy and recording all of the events they're supposed to be recording. Uh, when we see a deficiency, we then conduct an investigation to determine why that person did not record. We also do samplings of body camera video to look for compliance with uh, policy in terms of the quality of police service, uh, how the member of the service handled the job, uh, but also whether or not the body camera video, uh, body camera was activated at the appropriate time uh, and recorded the event as, as required. Uh, in addition to that, we require sergeants in every precinct that has body cameras uh, to review a certain number of body camera videos every month. Uh, and we look at that, we assign them the body camera videos we want them to review, so it truly is a random selection, uh, and they have to review them not only to review the video to assess whether or not the police officer complied with uh, the body camera policy, uh, but also to uh, assess the quality of the police service. Did they handle the job the right way? Were they professional? Uh, we also uh, require uh, other supervisors in the command like the integrity control officer and the precinct training sergeant to review uh, video periodically uh, and, and make assessments on, on the video. Uh, we follow up uh, with all of these uh, through the reporting and the analysis that we do on a weekly and a monthly basis. We also incorporate uh, reviews of body camera video and compliance issues into CompStat uh, and other programmatic reviews that we do uh, uh, like uh, force review and uh, uh, other investigations. All right, and there were 97 civilian staff hired, so how do they fit into this, if anybody could answer this as well for the program as well? So it's, it's actually, I think we're below the 97. Commissioner Grippa will talk about where we currently are. Uh, but those civilians who are hired are mostly media service technicians, and they've been, uh, they currently staff uh, the Risk Management Bureau, the Legal Bureau, uh, and there are also some people hired for the Information Technology Bureau okay. uh, to support. So those are the people who are doing a lot of these video reviews, looking okay. at video, checking for compliance. So those 97. Comparing video to other data sets, uh, putting together a review package, you know, for example, for CompStat for each week, depending upon which borough is, is coming in, we'll look at their body camera usage and compliance uh, for the period. So that's the group or the groups that are doing that analysis. Uh, Commissioner Prunty can talk about legal in more detail, uh, but those are the folks who are generally reviewing video and processing subpoena requests uh, and, and FOIL requests. As far as sharing with the DA, so it's not just body cameras, it's an entire mm -hmm. body camera and video management system that we use. Uh, so the body cameras capture the video, the police officers dock their cameras at the end of tour, the video automatically uploads into the data storage solution, there is software or a dashboard on our network where police officers can then access their video. So when an arrest is made or a DA needs a video, uh, the arresting officer will dock their camera, upload their video, log into the system, and then right within the system, will share that video to the DA. So the, 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 we don't have to you know, download anything or burn copies onto a disk. Uh, they can do it right within the system with a couple of clicks of the mouse and then the DA has instant access to it. The DAs all have access to the system. They've all been trained, uh, and, and they each have their own method for then downloading and processing the data on their end, but we're able to get it to them electronically within the system within minutes of upload. Thank you, okay, last questions. Uh, you get where I'm going on discipline. We'll continue to have more conversation. I'm just gonna go to Councilmember Miller and then Lanceman. I'm gonna ask you guys to be very concise and brief on your questions, because the, the commissioner does have to leave. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, uh, Commissioner and you, Commissioner and, and the team. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't start with putting on my labor hat and echoing the sentiments of my colleagues and saying that I, too, support uh, pay parity and equity with the uh, officers in the uh, agencies throughout the New York region, and certainly our men and women are deserving of that. Also, I'd like to thank the commissioner for coming out to JMC uh, this past Friday for the street renaming and, and all the uh, additional support that we've gotten uh, in the marshes throughout New York City. It is greatly appreciated, and um, we have a security meeting that is going on tonight. Hopefully, that we will be, uh, the department will be well represented there as well. Give you that information. So, I, I do want to talk a little bit off just uh, on the transportation side. I'd like to talk about the um, 
Bus lane enforcement, since the mayor's announcement in the state of the city this past January, uh, where have we gone, at, uh, have we seen any increase in summonses and uh, enforcement uh, around uh, the bus lane enforcement? So know? Chief Chan will give you a very short and concise and accurate answer. Very short, very concise. Um, in accurate, terms of um, bus lane moving violations, in 2018 we issued 8,037. Compared to 2017, it was 2020. Bus lane parking violations, last year we issued 38,000 summonses, 38,419 compared to 23,647. Bus stop parking violations, last year we issued 312,752 compared to 305,712. Uh, again, uh, we've done a lot of enforcement in that area. Um, we meet with, the, with our MTA partners. The feedback that we've gotten is that we've seen some improvement in terms of the movement of our buses. Uh, they've identified 12 specific lines that have been problematic. We've been targeting those areas for enforcement. So we do see improvement on that. Do you think that the, I believe it is 2.3, 2.7 million dollars that is in this preliminary budget uh, for bus lane enforcement will be sufficient, particularly compared to the nearly $100 million for secured bike lanes that we see throughout the city? I think that the, the enforcement that the NYPD has done and our response has been uh, overwhelmingly positive that we've seen from our MTA partners and also uh, from what, uh, the feedback that we've gotten from DOT. Okay. Um, I, I, we, we haven't seen, uh, I think the buses are still traveling at about five, six miles per hour. We have some work to be done and, and look forward to working with you on that. I don't want to stay on that, but I do want to stay in, in the uh, area of transportation. I know that the uh, transportation committee uh, requires certain information data around complaints uh, and um, in the subways and buses, and I know that felonies are up about 11 and a half percent. Uh, major felonies, uh, what are we doing there, and the overall complaints uh, on assaults on MTA workers as well, buses and trains. Uh, I have not seen it, it should be part of the reporting. Uh, do you have that data now? And if not, when can we expect it? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> okay, I can speak as to the trains. Assaults on uh, uh, MTA workers are down this year, uh, four versus seven, and I believe we ended the year down last year as well in the subway system only. I'm only speaking to the subway system. And overall crime in the subway system is down this year as well. Is that data not collected for bus operators and others on the surface side? Ed, uh, well, uh, council member, we're gonna have to get those numbers for you. Yep. Okay. Uh, let me just jump back around here. Um, let's talk about, uh, you know, I, I would, along with the chair and, and a few other members of the uh, of this committee, had the privilege of of being briefed by the counterterrorism uh, uh, group here, and and I don't believe that any of us walked out of there with. Uh, feeling really good about the information that we receive, particularly as it pertains to surveillance around and, and proactively being engaged in being able to prevent uh, activities around white nationalists. Um, could you, as much as possible, considering what we've seen in recent times and in between the time that we've met, I think that was about in, in sometime in the fall, and now is, what are we doing around that area? Yep, we'll get Commissioner Miller to speak about that. John? Sure. Uh, we continue to monitor uh, online forums, propaganda. Uh, we continue to investigate groups that fall within to the investigative guidelines that we operate under. And we use the same team that we use for all other terrorist or potentially violent activities or violations of laws. I think the point was that we did not feel that they were being investigated with the same vigor as some other groups, particularly, quite frankly, even a group like Black Lives Matter, which we know aren't a terrorist organization, but have been known to be surveilled. 
Uh, we investigate groups based on the Hanshu guidelines, based on the possibility of, of the violation of law, and we treat all groups the same. I think it's an important point to make that when we are sorting through potential subjects for investigation, it is based on the activities of individuals, whether those activities are in violation of the law, uh, whether there are groups of people that um, engage in activities that may possibly violate the law. We have very strict guidelines. We like these rules because they give us structure. Uh, what we have seen, which is of great interest, is uh, if you look at the attack in New Zealand, if you look at um, some of the propaganda, uh, that they are adopting each other's tactics, each other's uh, propaganda systems, um, each other's uh, uh, training, communications, uh, and they are agnostic in their tactics to the cause. We're agnostic to the cause in our investigations. What we look at is, is there a potential for violence? Is there a potential for a violation of the law? And does it fit within the guidelines to investigate? And then we investigate. Uh, I don't know how else to respond um, on the level of vigor in that we treat all cases the same. So uh, I, I know that we, we, we can't really have that conversation publicly, and, and I'd love to have the opportunity yeah, but if we need to, do to that, further have that we conversation need to do that privately also. about some of our concerns there. And, and so I do just want to f finish with... Um, can I, can I just add to John's statement, you know, that we do investigate all terrorist and hate groups with equal vigor. So I, I don't want anybody to walk away from, from this hearing think that, thinking that we don't. And they are all subjected to uh, handshoe guidelines, as John said. Okay. So um, let's just jump and finally talk about marijuana disparities. Um, obviously, that's been a big deal over the past few years, particularly for us in Southeast Queens, having a precinct that has had 13 percent of all the marijuana arrests and summonses throughout the city. Um, is that still the case? And yeah. also, um, are these arrests and summonses uh, occurring in the vicinity of nature housing? As far as the location, I'm going to have to uh, get back to you with more specifics there. But as, as far as the 105 precinct con is concerned, and that's, I know that's what we're talking about, the enforcement has decreased dramatically. Uh, Natisse Gilbert is now the CO there. She's the deputy inspector. Uh, we spoke before about uh, disparity and an overall enforcement, uh, marijuana enforcement. And I did state that our marijuana arrests, misdemeanor arrests, are down 91.5 percent. It's a, it's a considerable number, 3,259. While the, and disparities still exist, and uh, the chair and I uh, agreed that we would continue to figure out why this is continuing to happen. Okay, and the locations, we'll get that later on, whether yeah. or not. Yep. Thank you yep, so very you. much. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Right. Last question, uh, and then I'm going to ask Chief Shea to stay behind. I, I know he doesn't want to. <laughs> um, and Helen has uh, some closing questions, and I know you have to go, so I want to respect your time. Uh, Councilmember Lansman, last question. Yeah, thank you. So, um, again, on the subject of marijuana and uh, our concern that the department seems to continue to arrest people for THC oil possession and, and I'll say, smoking, um, vaping. As you know, last year in February, we had a hearing on the disparities in marijuana enforcement, uh, both in policing and prosecution. Um, when the data came out and ended up being analyzed, the New York Times came out with a, a front page story in May of that year, headlined, the surest way to face marijuana charges in New York, be black or Hispanic. And the mayor almost within days announced that the city was going to revisit its policy. And we've been talking about that policy today. My colleagues have talked about the racial disparities issue. Um, it's come to our attention, though, that the department and, and the police officers are still uh, arresting people and prosecutors are still charging them under uh, who are found in possession or vaping um, this THC oil, which, as you know, is the I guess the active ingredient in marijuana. And I wanted to know um, that the chair and I sent a letter to you, Commissioner, in November, and we have not heard back. That's uh, nearly four months, is it? <clears throat> which I have mentioned to you privately, but I'll say it publicly, that lack of response is really unacceptable and I, 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 and I think disrespectful. Yep. Uh, let's get to the issue, though, although if you want to comment on the lack of response, I won't yep. prevent you from doing so. I agree with you. Okay. 
Um, so why is the department still arresting people for THC possession? They're getting charged with an A misdemeanor, criminal possession of a controlled substance in the seventh degree, which is also the charge for someone who has a small amount of um, a heroin in their possession. Why isn't THC oil covered by the marijuana, the new marijuana policy? There, there are some issues, and uh, Ann Prunty, uh, Assistant Commissioner from DCLM, will speak about them. Clear, just to be clear, um, my understanding is that uh, the director of our legislative affairs unit has been in touch with your chief of staff in response to that letter over the course of the past few months. But be that as it may. No, I'm, I'm sorry, he hasn't. No, with all due respect to Oleg, he's a great guy and we talk all the time, we haven't gotten a response. No, I understand you haven't gotten a response, but I just wanted to let you know that we have been in touch with you about the letter. And just, I'm gonna interrupt, we should have given you a written response, apologize for that. So, so with respect to the THC oil, during the time that you sent your letter up until now, we have looked at that carefully. And we did a survey of the different uh, DAs to see what the charging situation was across the boroughs. And we found out that there was a pretty significant discrepancy in the charging uh, among the different bureaus, uh, um, among the different DAs. And so as a result, we have embarked upon the adoption and we're in the process of doing this, formulating a policy whereby if it's THC oil, will be charging the marijuana uh, offense. And the only time that we would be then charging the 22003 would be in the instance where the oil has the chemicals that are contained in K2, because that is a, a controlled substance. Right. When you say the marijuana charge, you mean 22010, and, and, or you mean 22005? It would be the 22005. 221. 22105, right. I'm sorry, yeah. 22003 is control substance. Right. Thank you. All right. And so what you're saying is unless the THC oil is, is mixed or contaminated with something else, if it's just the K2. THC, then those individuals will be treated the same as you treat people who are burning or, or possessing uh, actual marijuana leaves in, in public. Um, yes. Good? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm happy to hear that. I just, I just have a question, though. My understanding is there's no field test for, for THC, so, so how is that distinction going to be made? Well, we're going to be defaulting to the 22105 offense. It. Then it will be tested by the lab if there's a testing by the lab that turns out to be the chemicals of K2, um, and the case is still in the system, the prosecutors will have the option of amending that complaint and charging the 22003. Excellent. And last thing, on the issue of disparities, it hasn't really been touched on yet, but are you willing to reconsider the exceptions to the current marijuana policy, almost all of which um, are driven by someone's prior or current criminal justice system involvement? And are you do you, do you acknowledge, do you, do, you, do you agree that when you exempt people from the more liberal marijuana uh, possession and, and, and burning policy based on their prior or current criminal justice system involvement, that you are fishing in a pool that is more concentrated of people of color, and that is why you are seeing the actual increase in racial disparities under the new policy, even while you are arresting <clears throat> fewer people. We're looking to have further discussions, and I certainly wouldn't want, if, if all the prior criminal history was 221 offenses, I, I would agree with you. But uh, you know, the strategy of reducing homicides from 2,245 down to less than 300 last year, you know, it's, 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 it's well thought out and it's evolved over time. So I think it would require uh, more discussion with you to, to get where uh, maybe some sort of compromise. I'm not sure if we can get there. There's a, there's a lot to lose here, but uh, we will continue discussions if, you, if you'd like. Sorry. Thank and you, Council. Just one last thing. That, that, just the, the THC policy, sorry. Is that going to be uh, added to the patrol guide? Like, w when will we see that this is in print and, and well, we're it's clarified? It. We're working on it, and we'll get back to you on that. Okay. The first thing you'll see is a response to your letter. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you.
Thank you so much, uh, and I'm gonna ask Chief Shea to stay behind just for, for one question from Helen. Uh, but I wanna thank you, Commissioner. I wanna thank you for your time today. Um, just some follow-ups from uh, this specific hearing. A um, few items, the average headcount data and methodology we're looking for. Second, the average length of rape cases being opened or worked on. Three, our data on percentage of unfounded and uncooperative victims by borough and in, in their unco uncooperative complaint victims by borough. Um, four, our, our data on uh, January 2019 cold cases from the uh, uh, from Special Victims Unit. Um, five follow-ups from Council Member Gibson's questions. Um, looking to hear more on 50A and the recommendations by the disciplinary panel. Uh, hate crimes unit, uh, you know, there has been an increase. I spoke on discipline and then also Council Member Miller, uh, Miller's question on uh, public housing and summonses and arrests happening around specifically public housing. And then lastly, the 116th precinct was budgeted, uh, budget went up to 16 million, which I'm, uh, 16 million more, which I'm not complaining about. We just wanna hear a little bit more specifics uh, about why and, 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 and why that increase was needed. Uh, and all the other questions we didn't get a chance to, to certainly address here today. Um, there also was a proposal uh, that I believe PD rolled out on uh, not responding to car accidents anymore. Um, so when we come back for exec, we look forward to hearing a little bit more, but in yeah, between that, time. That, that's a very limited pilot, but we'll yeah. discuss it with you. Yeah. Um, with that being said, thank you so much for coming today. Thank you for your time. We look forward to our continued strong partnership with you. We want to thank the men and women of the NYPD for what they do. Okay, Chief Shea, come. come. Thanks to the chair. Thanks to the council. Thank you. Thank you. Chief Shea. I'd love to. <laughs> All right. Yes, you can. Yes. Barricade jobs still going on on the eighth floor on Court Street. Thank you, guys. It's still going on. It's, it might be all but a flyer on there. I see the floor of the drone up there. Yeah, it's a barricade. He came over about 852 this morning. He's alone. His brother pulled him. suicidal. Thank you. Yes, No, sir. That's why I was making eye contact with him. Let's shoot him. Well, let's try not to. Chief Shea?
Just can't get enough of me. <laughs> no. I'm a fan. I could have uh, Chief Del Torre speak, too. Sure. <laughs> All right. Press? Yes. All righty, we're going to begin in one minute again. All righty, Chief Shea, you get to stay behind. It's like when I leave my chief of staff behind after a tough meeting. This is what the real work gets done. <laughs> All righty, uh, just a uh, final question from Helen Rosenthal. Yep. Thank you so much, Chief. Um, the first thing I just wanted to impress uh, upon the NYPD is that the advocates really appreciate the work that you've been doing with them, the open meetings, um, and the hard work I think the NYPD is doing to build trust. For example, um, you know, uh, bringing the advocates now into the interview rooms, allowing them to go in with a victim of sexual assault, and I just wanted to pass along that message of deep appreciation. Um, and I wanted to confirm on the record that you'll continue to um, invite the advocates to the reading, to read the cold cases, the um, Timoney review. Yeah, I think that that has uh, been very beneficial on both sides. It's, uh, uh, I, I've heard nothing but good news, so we look forward to that partnership. Great, thank you. Um, quick question about moving detectives around again. Did any of the 84 detectives moved over to drug investigations as part of Healing NYC come from the Special Victims Division? Are you talking about opiate investigations? Yes which, I mean, you're going back probably a year or two. I'd have to check. I don't have that answer. Okay. I think with Thrive NYC, they recently announced that 84 detectives had been moved over. So, but you'll get back to see whether or not they had been moved out of the SVP. I, I, I'm, uh, you'd, you'd have to give me a little more information on what 84, uh, I'm not, uh, perhaps it's me, but I'm not following you with what unit you're referring to that they were moved to? Sure, yes. This is on the opioid abuse. It's part of the Thrive NYC Okay, issue. I'm not aware of any recent transfers of anyone uh, to that. I, I think you're going back over a year, if I'm correct. Okay. It would have been, so just to be clear, the 84 was an increase to our headcount. It was done. The way it ended up being funded was an offset where we, drew, we um, brought down some civilian positions and we received 84 additional um, uniformed heads, and we ultimately then assigned 84 detectives. That goes back, I, I'm, I, I would say it's about 18 months okay. um, from when we assigned those detectives, but it would have been an increase overall to the right. Detective Bureau staffing. Um, it would not have been a situation where we were just taking in people from one area, moving them, and not, not backfilling those positions because these were newly created Detective Bureau positions. Got it. If you could just confirm that the anyone that would have come from SVD was indeed backfilled? Sure. Great. Yep. Thank you. Um, I wanted to know the status of FETI training for the detectives, um, sort of what the total number of detectives is and how many trained. And my last question, because I've run out of time, has to do with cautioning you again about reviewing the um, uh, sexual assault cases as if they were the usual comp stat cases. These are not cases where we want to push detectives to close them faster. These are cases where, you know, it's probably this is a trauma victim and 
more likely than not, it would in, it would take much longer to close a case. Um, yeah, so I just wanting to make sure that the SVD cases are not being. Yeah, I, I think I think in. that was my exact point earlier that each case is unique. We move at the speed uh, uh, of the survivor. With that being said, um, you know we we still do have an accountability measure, Comstat. Um, it's not unique to special victims. It's something that we're, we look at the work of our investigators and police officers across the agency to make sure they're doing everything that they should be doing. So it's a mixed response there. Uh, we will continue to look at sex crimes cases during the CompStat process, but it is certainly not to say that we're pushing cases or the measure we're looking at is uh, that their cases aren't being closed in a, in a fast enough time. For example, we want to make sure that the work that should be done, whether it's witness canvases, video canvases, DNA testing is done. There's a lot of different metrics that we use, and it's all with the goal towards making New York City safer. To the well, FETI- to that point, yep. you know, it might We're on the same page. 72 hours or 30 days to get back a rape kit, so you wouldn't want to, you know, ding a detective yep. for not closing a case fast enough, but they're waiting. Hundred percent agree. Okay. And to the Fetty point, uh, we're in a, we're in a good place. We do have some work to do still. We're we're in a good place in terms of the membership of the special victims division being Fetty trained. However, uh, we do have uh, a recent group of again I I said earlier 35. It may actually be 37 or 38 that co have come in that still require. Uh, the FETI training. They're not catching cases yet. They're undergoing additional training in the meantime, but we're working on uh, getting additional contracts to get FETI training. And so you only have the 36, 37 officers remaining to get FETI? Everyone yeah, else? if there's one or two sprinkled somewhere, Councilwoman, that's possible, but I don't believe that's the case. The vast majority of special victims has already been FETI trained. Great. If you could come back to exec with that exact number to let us know. Yeah, I'll have uh, Chief Harrison follow up. And I do have that number because there was some confusion earlier regarding 5,000, 8,000. In 2015, so, there, in yes. 2015, I'm sorry to go back again, there was 1,100 plus cases that were tested that came into the department. DNA we, cases. Yes, that's when a team was stood up to test those that's cases. Right. Yep. That, that backlog has now been cleared. That team is going, that backlog of You're cases has been tested, shy. and those cases have been cleared, meaning investigated. The 5,000 or 8,000 number, no, no, I- No, I, the, the, um, the larger number had to do with unsolved stranger rape cases. Uh, what I'm telling they you though is that's not, that's the, not based in fact. Sure, but they're not the DNA. The DNA cases, my understanding is, there are 150 from um, January 2019 that still have not cleared. We will follow up. Okay, and that's of the 1,100 plus. Okay. I, I, I think that I we're to disagree that with up. that, you but respectfully, right. yep. Yep, you were right. There was confusion about the larger number and the smaller number. It's totally true. So the stranger rape cases don't necessarily have DNA evidence, but they are That's stranger rape cases that are still unsolved. I just think that, that anyone that is uh, giving you information that this 5,000 or 8,000. No, no, I misspoke. Oh, all okay. on me. My no, bad. No, that's all right. My bad. Gotcha. So it's 150 DNA cold cases and then some in the multiple thousands number of stranger rapes that have not been solved, cold okay, cases. So I'm in constant contact with our lab. Uh, we have a very robust lab. We work hand in hand with the Office of the Chief Medical yep. Examiner. I am with confidence told that we have no backlog on uh, sexual assault cases. So I will, uh, as soon as I leave here, confirm that. Okay, you know, let's talk offline. We may have a, a nomenclature Yeah, I, that's what I think problem. it is. And, and to your earlier point, just thanking uh, special victims for the, the work with the advocates. That is greatly yep. appreciated. Thank yep. you. Yep, absolutely. Thank, Thank you, you, Chief Shea, for being so gracious. Thank you. All right, we're now going to have the Civilian Complaint Review Board come up. Thank you, Donna.
All righty. Can I have Chair Fred Davey, Reverend? Chair Reverend Frederick Davey. <laughs> you are ordained. We better acknowledge it. All righty, Chair Reverend Frederick Davey. We're going to have you sworn in. And then uh, and John Dorsch and Janine Marie. And you may begin after you're sworn in. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to this committee and answer all questions to the best of your ability? I do. Ready? <clears throat> Chairperson Richards and members of the Public Safety Committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear here today. Uh, as you've said, I'm Reverend Frederick Davey, Chair of the Civilian Com Complaint Review Board. I am joined by agency staff members uh, Jonathan Darsh, our Executive Director, uh, and Janine Marie, our Deputy Executive Director for Administration. Uh, I have submitted a full testimony to the committee staff and now will present a short oral uh, presentation. Over the past year, the agency has rededicated itself to better serving its complainants, many coming from the most vulnerable communities uh, and diverse communities in New York, including young people, the homeless, LGBTQ individuals, those with mental illnesses, people living with disabilities, and people of low income. In February 2018, the board unanim unanimously uh, voted to adopt a resolution directing agency staff to begin investigating and prosecuting certain allegations of sexual misconduct that had previously been referred to the NYPD's Internal Affairs Bureau and to develop a plan to investigate and prosecute allegations of, sexual crimi of criminal sexual misconduct. Now, from more than a year later, the agency has received 83 complaints containing 126 allegations of sexual harassment, sexual or romantic propositions, sexual humiliation, and sexually motivated strip searches, and has created an internal working group to determine how best to incorporate investigations and prosecutions of sexual assault into uh, agency operations. We're currently working with OMB to obtain funding to develop a victim advocacy and support program and commenced a number of training initiatives aimed at better supporting victims of sexual violence. The CCRB is committed to protecting the mental health and well-being of our complainants. In 2018, the agency adopted new policies and procedures aimed at providing civilians with information about access to mental health services. In the past year, the CCRB Investigations Division also received comprehensive training related to mental health issues, including forensic experiential trauma interview or FETI training and mental health first aid certification training. We consider educating the public to be an important part of our mandate and work hard to deliver information to civilians. The CCRB staff endeavors to reach all New York, commu all New York uh, communities, delivering over 1,000 presentations in 2018, the largest number in agent agency history to audiences including high school students, immigrant populations, probationary groups, homeless service organizations, formerly incar incarcerated individuals, NYCHA residents, and LGBTQ groups. The agency was able to make those efforts because it was fully staffed at the time with an outreach team of six people who were grant who, who we, that we were granted by the City Council. In anticipation of the Right to Know Act becoming effective in October 2018, the CCRB constructed a full public education campaign in partnership with members of the City Council that involved creation of educational materials and distribution of these materials via street team efforts, participation in press and social media efforts, and working with elected officials to help provide information to constituents. Further evidence of our commitment to public education is our February Youth Summit at New York University organized by the first ever CCRB Youth Advisory Council and our police uh, symposium at uh, John Jay College of Criminal Justice, at which, Mr. Chairman, you spoke, and we really appreciate it. In 2018, the board also made a number of procedural changes to ensure disciplinary consistency. 
In January of last year, the board piloted the use of a disciplinary framework, a non-binding matrix designed to guide board panel discussions on disciplinary recommendations for substantiated cases and at achieving consistent and fair discipline recommendations for both civilians and members of service. Now, a year later, we are evaluating ways to expand that structure to non-charges as well. There have also been challenges over the past year. In 2018, the CCRB received 4,745 complaints within its jurisdiction, an increase of nearly 11 percent from just two years prior. Further, uh, 2018 saw over 200 more fourth quarter complaints received in the CCRB's jurisdiction than 2017. And the highest, this is the highest number since 2013. Though it's too early to tell for sure, some of these additional complaints may be related or may have been related to the Right to Know Act. Since it went into effect, the agency has received 137 complaints containing 229 allegations of a failure to provide a business card under that act. One type of evidence that is becoming increasingly prevalent in our investigations is NYPD body-worn camera footage. To date, the agency has requested such footage in more than 2,000 of its investigations. While video evidence has played a role in the CCRB's education, uh, investigations over time, the amount of footage in CCRB's electronic evidence repository has exponentially increased, in part due to the continued expansion of the BWC program. To date, video uh, footage occupies more than three and a half terabytes of space, with 300 gigabytes of that added in January 2019 alone. While it is still too early to tell the true effect of BWCs on investigations of misconduct, video evidence in general plays a major role in the outcomes of investigations increasing the likelihood that a case will be closed on the merits. Unfortunately, this additional evidence has, with this additional evidence has come an increase in the number of days it takes to close cases. In 2018, the agency trained all of its investigators in forensic video analysis techniques, which are now employed in all investigations. These techniques involve tra uh, transcription notations and multiple viewings of videos increasing the length of time it takes to close all investigations, not just those with video. Investigators must identify each of the individuals in video footage to identify witnesses and take detailed notes as to, as to statements made and events that occur, often requiring frame-by-frame -frame review. We're working with the OMB to monitor and address these challenges head-on. For the current fiscal year, FY 2019, the CCIB has, has a modified budget of $17,173,879, $13,102,052 for personnel services, and $4,071,827 for other than personnel services, a category which includes funding for, among other things, training initiatives and video footage storage. The agency is determined to continue to improve its service to the people of the City of New York, and due to the support of this administration and the Council, the agency is stronger than ever and better able to provide strong, effective, and independent civilian oversight of the New York City Police Department. But there's far more for us to do, far more to be done. I am confident with your help, the CCRB will continue to flourish and improve and lead the way in civilian oversight nationally. Thank you for your time and continued support, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Chair Davey, Reverend. Um, so uh, let me start with what new needs, if any, have you requested from the ad administration and OMB? So we've been working closely with OMB through the ADP process to request new needs. We received uh, funding for the Blake Fellow in the last year. Uh, we've been working with them on the uh, victim assistance uh, process. We've currently submitted uh, a request for uh, proposals for staff from, uh, from providers to see if they can help us pro staff the witness assistance unit and uh, we've asked for more funding for uh, 
investigators and other staff to meet the potential increase in uh, in uh, from potentially from the Right to Know Act. And uh, what's the cost, estimated cost for those? One moment. And I guess, uh, Chair Davey, if you can speak to, uh, while you get that data. Uh, Approximately $1.3 million. How much? $1.3 million. $1.3 million, okay. And have you identified if the partial hiring freeze will affect your staffing needs? It may. We're working with the Office of Management and Budget uh, to make sure that this agency is equipped to face the, the demands of the upcoming year. Okay. Uh, I think you spoke of implicit bias training. Can you just go through as everybody trained uh, in CCRB? So there may be new staff that has not been trained. Uh, the, the, I thought the implicit bias training was very helpful, not just for staff, but for the board as well. And I think, uh, I think when we originally scheduled the implicit bias training, we did not realize how much we needed it. Mm. It was originally viewed as something we needed uh, to understand the, how the department functions. But frankly, we needed it to understand our, our own processes and our own behaviors and attitudes. And it's something that, uh, you know, we're going to be working with the Office of Management Budget and the City Council to make sure we can do again in the future. And, uh, is that going to cost uh, any further funding needed for uh, training? I, I be believe it would. Uh, I'd have to get back to you with the exact number. And who's doing the training? It was a Perception Institute. And the only reason I know that, Mr. Chair, is one, I took the training, and two, they were so good I'm now using them at my institution at the uh, Union Seminary uptown. Perception training, you said? Perception Institute. Okay, Perception Institute, okay. Uh, can you just go through, I know that you had some charter revision requests. I just wanted to get you on the record on what some of those requests were. So the, the first request was for uh, a small technical change to the charter that would allow executive staff to sign subpoenas as opposed to just having the executive director sign subpoenas. The chair. Oh, <laughs> my apologies, the chair. The, uh, the second would be to codify the APU. The third was to enhance the language that's currently in the charter with regard to the duty to cooperate of the police department with the CCRB. And the last would be to uh, set the CCRB budget at 1% of the, the NYPD's budget. Okay, good. Just want to get that on the record. Let's just talk. Uh, let's talk about caseload time for a second. So the PMMR shows that the time to complete investigations increased in FY18, as compared to FY17, from 153 to 190 days. Can you speak a little bit more? I know you went into body cameras, but I don't. It's. It's. We believe it's a large uh, degree covered by body worn camera footage. When we get body worn camera footage. It's not just you watch a five-minute video and move on with your, with your day, uh, with, with your investigation. You have to watch it numerous times. You put it through software that lets you analyze the, the footage and make determinations about what happened. And sometimes for one incident, there may be multiple officers on the scene with body-worn camera footage. There may be multiple videos that you have to view. Not every video is, is, is eventually going to be determinative in a case, but you still have to watch all that, that body-worn camera footage, and it's, it puts a real strain on our investigators and, and our processes. And let me um, go through, um, so how long does it take for NYPD to get back to you on um, footage? Right now, the what is the quality of the footage and the resolution and distance and how often is camera footage unavailable even though the officer had a camera? What has been your experience so far? So, so in cases where the uh, department is able to correctly respond on our first request, the average response time is eight days. There are some times uh, where we have to make a second or third request uh, and that that will take up to 28 days to get a response. 
the the department has has recently added a new camera to its uh, repertoire when it when Axon purchased VView. I'm much more familiar with the VView cameras, and I think they're excellent. I I can't give you a an opinion of the quality of the 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 Axon cameras, to be honest with you. And you said 28 days after your second or third request. Uh, is that 28 business days? I, I actually think that's days. Just days. But, but we could get back to you on okay. that. Okay. And um, I know we they said that they had someone specifically assigned to deal with different agencies. Have you found that to be true? So is the, there a specific the, person you deal with when you put a request in? Can you just go through that process? So the, the way our process currently works is uh, our investigators uh, send requests uh to internal affairs, internal affairs then sends those requests to NYPD legal. NYPD legal has a team that conducts the searches, responds back to uh, internal affairs, and then internal affairs responds to us. And you said eight days. Has that been your overall experience in getting on average eight days, or so do it, you find it to be more the two to three request range that tends to uh, occur. Could, could, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I was just Mr. saying, um, you uh, spoke that on average, I think you get footage in eight days, but sometimes you have to make um, the second and third requests, which can take upwards of 28 days. So I just wanted to get like the ratio or the comparison between um, you receiving footage in so eight days. Do you find I would that say more, more than 90%, like 92% of the time, we're getting our initial request. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, you know, we might not realize that an initial request was denied improperly until later in the process. So we make a request for footage. It, it's, we're told there's no footage. We bring in an officer for an interview and they say, oh no, I had my camera or, oh no, I didn't have a camera, but my partner had a camera. And so getting that worked out is sometimes timely. And you're documenting those who say they don't have cameras because supposedly every officer has cameras now in the department. So, so are you documenting that data when officers say they don't have their cameras or don't have their cameras on? So we do, we do monitor that. Okay, so I would love to see those numbers. Um, but I would just like to add, you know, when we're doing an investigation, there is time lag. So, especially early on when we were requesting body-worn camera footage, not every, so the numbers we're giving you wouldn't necessarily reflect the, the current. Uh, but the, I just I want to get a sampling yes. of how 100%. often we'll get it for you. people deny they have a camera. Um, um, the budget added a one-time addition of $50,000 for camera footage storage. Uh, how much data will this funding store and how long will the storage last before it is full? Mr. Chair, I'm not 100% certain on the, like, the number of terabytes, but that should keep us covered for a year and a half. This a is a situation that we've been working closely with the Office of Management and Budget and do it in other city agencies to try and deal with uh, this issue. Uh, and I think everyone viewed the $50,000 as a temporary measure to tr until we can come up with a a more global solution. And then uh, earlier the NYPD acknowledged that the DAs have instant access. Do you have instant access? No, we do not. Do you think you should have instant access? Yes, we do. Okay. All righty. Let's go through sexual misconduct again. So C CCRB has added sexual misconduct as portfolio cases. Phase one, which includes sexual harassment allegations, has already begun. Phase two, which includes sexual assaults, has not begun, correct? That is correct. All right. Do you have a timeline for the beginning of phase two? We don't have a timeline yet. Uh, we've established three different areas that we need to be working on before we can, before I can go to the, the chair and the board and tell them we're ready to move to phase two. The first is we need to train a cadre of investigators that's sufficient to handle the, the load of, uh, of sexual misconduct allegations that we're getting, the sexual assault allegations that we're getting. We've been working with uh, experts in the field and advocate groups such as the New York City Alliance Against Sexual Assault 
and uh, and we've brought in uh, as Councilperson Rosenthal was addressing earlier with NYPD. We've done FETI training for uh, a, a small group of our investigators. Uh, it was it was really eye opening for the agency, and it's something that we think we need to. Uh, adopt throughout our agency, not just for dealing with victims of sexual misconduct, but for all uh, civilians who come to our agency. If you think about it, if you're walking down the street and you're uh, stopped on the street while you're with your child, that could be just as traumatic for the person who is stopped or the child of the person who is stopped as, as, as any other incident that, that we investigate. And so I think coming up with uh, resources for this agency to make sure that we are not re-traumatizing people in the process of our investigations is extremely important. All right, I know Councilmember Rosen, Councilwoman Rosenthal will have more to say on that, so I'm gonna move on from that. Um, investigators, can you comment on turnover and attrition rates, um, and, which are hovering somewhere around 9%, and just identify a few strategies you utilizing to reduce attrition within CCRB? So we have, we, we have created a path to promotion, which is, uh, uh, we're hopeful that when people see that they can have careers at the CCRB, the, they will be more inclined to stay with us and take the skills that they uh, have learned uh, and acquired through doing the work and taking the training that we give them to stay at our agency. Uh, Go through the starting salaries of investigators. I heard a few coughs in the back. Is it true? <laughs> <laughs> I, I believe Hold your it's, laughs. I believe it's Hold it in, all right? Or, oh, oh, no, oh, no, I'm sorry. I was actually referring to the CCRB staff, but okay, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I, I think it's 36,000, uh, but I could check on that. Can we do better? So I think our I level one investigators are, are tied to the to a citywide contract for for that's been negotiated for confidential investigators. So we we have addressed the fact that the overall salary for starting investigators is low by creating the path to promotion. So after a year, if you if you are evaluated as being uh, a quality investigator, we will promote you to a level two investigator. When I first got to the agency- Does that come with more pay? Yes, it does. Okay, how much more? I, I think it gets you in the mid 40s. 46. 46,000. Okay. All right, so then, I, I'm gonna go on a record and just saying, just as folks are calling for the NYPD to be well paid, that you know those who are also um, doing work to hold uh, the system accountable, which helps police officers get home safely as well, and, um, and helps our communities be safe also, receive a raise as well. So I would look forward to working with whoever, whomever I need to, to make sure that those we're tasking with holding, making the city better, receives better pay. Who do I need to speak to on this? The mayor or? or I, I think the Office of Labor Relations. Labor Relations, okay. So we'll start with a letter from there. Um, okay. Um, all right, I'm gonna go to Helen Rosenthal for questions. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, good afternoon. Good Thank afternoon, you man. for coming in. Really appreciate your work. Really thrilled to hear about uh, the start of the um, investigations around sexual harassment. Really appreciate that your first step would be to get Fetty trained yourselves. It's remarkable um, what you learn on this. You were starting to say that in order to move to phase two, you wanted to do three things internally, so the first is get FETI trained. Uh, the second is to establish some kind of, of unit that will provide support to uh, victims and witnesses of uh, sexual misconduct, whether it's sexual harassment. Oh, sexual to have assault. a dedicated unit. Yes. 
Okay. Uh, and we've actually started the RFP process for the, the line staff of that unit, which we think would be, you, you know, we, we think would be approximately four people that we would need as the, the line. And then uh, on our actual staff, one, one supervisor or director. And then the third area is just our internal procedures to make sure that we're properly handling uh, these cases when they come in to make sure that if you're contacting our intake unit that you're speaking to someone who has gone through the training and, and uh, has, is, is capable of, of not re-traumatizing you when you're making your complaint uh, to make sure that any evidence that we collect is preserved the right way, yep. to make sure that uh, if there is going to be a prosecution that we don't, that, that we make sure that the DA's office knows uh, that we've had the complaint and is aware of it and can take any steps prior to us doing something that might hurt a potential investigation. Great, thank you. Um, you mentioned in your testimony that year to date, um, uh, a year after deciding to look into um, uh, sexual harassment. I just want to distinguish, you're looking at sexual harassment or, or sexual, S so the board has, has authorized the agency to investigate all complaints of sexual misconduct. Misconduct, the, okay. The board felt it was able to, that the staff could handle the phase one, the sexual harassment complaints, because they were more akin to complaints that we are currently handling now. But that the sexual assault cases uh, were, were something that we felt we needed to wait and make sure that we had kind of hit all those three benchmarks before we could begin investigating those. Okay, so sexual misconduct is what you're working on now, and phase two is sexual assault. So sexual misconduct is kind of the, the big picture, yeah. and oh. we divided that into two groups. Phase oh. one is sexual harassment, and phase two is sexual assault. Okay, so the sexually motivated strip searches is it's phase two. It's phase two. Okay, great. I just wanted to make sure I understood. And let me just add to that. I would hope that we really, sorry to cut you off, Helen, but that we move expeditiously on this. I don't want to leave sexual assaults lingering out there, strip searches, unwarranted, allegedly, and other things. And I, 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 I know we, you have to. We, sh get, we share your okay. desire to have it move as fast as possible, but we don't want our haste to, to Re damage. Re to damage a case against an officer, number one, but number two, re-traumatize people. And it's, it's, it's very important that we have the skills right. and, and capabilities before we tell people that we're able to do it. Agree, agree, but just. And you're, I think Councilmember Richards um, asked, has OMB um, given you <coughs> funding for those additional staff for this unit? So. So we're working closely with OMB on this, and we have, we are submitting an RFP for the for an organization to pro provide the staff that would be then supervised by a master of social work who was employed directly by CCRB. What's the difference between just hiring someone and an RFP I, to hire someone? Sorry, don't you just so ask this is, OMB? This is what, and OMB says yes or no. And and OMB. You know, we've been working with OMB to find a way to provide this very necessary service uh, to the public. And this is the way that OMB has identified that they think will be an effective way going forward. And so that's why we're, and so I, th I think if it is not, then we'll go back to OMB, put our heads together and come up with another solution. But right now they think this is a, a better way to do okay, it. Okay, and they've put funding in the budget for that. So I think right now they've given us permission to submit an RFP, and then keep I, us I'm posted. A hundred percent. I would. I'd be happy to advocate to OMB to make sure you get the funding necessary to do this work. I I, I appreciate. I, I think I speak I'll speak right. on behalf of the board and say we would strongly encourage that. <laughs> right. Okay. We can start uh, pushing for that now, and just want to confirm the 83 complaints. 
is can that be any um, either an NYP officer harassing an NYP officer and also an NYPD officer harassing a member of the public? So it could only be uh, a member of the service who's on duty harassing either a civilian or a member of service who's off duty. Got it. Right, because if it's on duty, it would go to IAB. If, if it's if there's any misconduct between two on-duty members of a service, that is not within the CCRB's jurisdiction. Got it. Okay. Um, those are my questions. I'm just thrilled that you're starting to look at it um, and agree with the chair if we could get a sense of timing for phase two. As, you know, maybe you could have timing assuming OMB authorizes the lines. Um, would it be maybe six months? I mean, FETI training can be 10 weeks. Um, so you have to get authorization to move forward and authorization to do FETI. So we've, we've already done some FETI training. Yep. And so we have a, a, a cadre of people that we, we could move to phase two with. It's just, uh, you know, we, we still have other other things to do before we're ready. And so we're working to do it as fast as possible. And I, I can tell you the board has been very, and the chair especially, has been very uh, uh, on top of it and making sure that we're moving forward as fast as possible. Really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, final questions. Um, so according to your website, complaints were the highest in 2018 since 2014. Um, allegations also increased from 14,670 in 2017 to 16,872 allegations in 2018. Uh, can you speak to the increase and do you expect an increase in 2019? And do you see more problematic precincts than others? For instance, I'm looking at the 34th precinct which had 16 complaints substantiated in it. Um, which I think is the highest in the city. So I just wanted to, for you to speak a little bit more on that. The, uh, so we think, we, we don't, we are still looking closely at the numbers. We think the reason for the increase in complaints is tied to very closely to the Right to Know Act. And so uh, traditionally complaint numbers will increase in the summer and decrease in as the colder weather comes in. And then this year we saw a reverse of that trend when uh, in October when the Right to Know Act was implemented and this agency along with uh, some of the city council members that had worked so hard on the Right to Know Act really did a lot of uh, public education work, going to people and making sure they were aware of their rights under the Right to Know Act. And we think that that, we, we don't have proof of that yet, but we believe that that, that caused the increase. Whether or not that continues into the new year, that's something that we're looking at closely with OMB to make sure if, if we need uh, more resources, more investigators, but also other resources that we'll, we'll have them. And uh, are you tracking, so based on cards being handed out, um, you know, how many of the cases are substantiated? So we are, we are tracking when if someone comes to us uh, and they make a complaint that they weren't given a card, mm -hmm. or if in the process of an interview we are able to determine they should have been given a card, we will ask if they were given a card. Now speak a little bit more about that. How many cases are you seeing where individuals come in who um, Warrant, uh, where it was warranted for them to receive a card and they did not receive it. Um. So, so right now we have 137 complaints containing 229 allegations that an officer failed to provide a Right to Know Act card. 
And of those 229 allegations, 174 are still pending. Uh, six were went to mediation, and 49 uh, we closed uh, without a full investigation. So out of those 229, you said? Yes. 137 should have received the card? No. Oh. So we have we have not made a determination yet. Not like made. It, it's okay. still it's th the investigations are still pending. Now just go through some of your metrics on the determination, just for the record. So it, it will depend on the, the level of stop that mm -hmm. that we determine occurred, and then whether or not we can determine if the person was actually given a card. Just because someone says they did not get it doesn't mean they weren't given one. So we have to- Now are you seeing it. cases, how many cases are you seeing where they should have been given a card? I, I don't have a, a number. It's too soon for us to, to have that for you because we have not completed the investigations. But you don't have like a box you can check? After, but in, until uh, we're uh, able until to you, substantiate okay. or unsubstantiate okay. something, we just can't tell you. Okay. Um, what about uh, search and consent? Uh, we could get you those numbers. I don't have them off the top, offhand. All right, pre-warning, we may have a hearing on this. Understood, understood. Okay. <laughs> uh, all righty. Uh, seeing none other, others here outside of me. You are duly released. Yeah, Thank great. you. Thank, Thank you. you for coming in. Thanks. All right, we're gonna take a five minute recess and then we're gonna come back and uh, hear from the public.
Okay. All right, we're gonna uh, begin again. I'm gonna ask Ralph Palladino, local 1549, DC 37, Shane Kareen, Correa. Correa, sorry, Center for Court Innovation, Avdesha Ray. Ray, New York City Anti Violence Project. Of day of day All righty. We're going to put four minutes on the clock. Longer than council members today. <laughs> in, the, in the chief, I forgot his name. <laughs> All right, we're going to go to you first, Mr. Palladino. Okay, good day. My name is Ralph Palladino, second vice president of the clerical administrative local 1549 DC 37. Uh, we represent um, members of the NYPD that are principal, uh, I'm sorry, police administrative aides and also the PCT, police uh, uh, communication technicians and supervisors for both titles and along with clerical associates. Um, the PCTs work in the 911 system. Um, the police commissioner had said, quote unquote, across the NYPD, we will continue to leverage every tool available to us to keep New York City safe. Um, we beg to differ that that's actually taking place. The issue of civilianization, which is the uniform uh, police officers, traffic enforcement agents, and s school aides uh, have been sitting in and doing clerical work of police administrative aides for well over uh, two decades. Uh, we won three arbitrations on this about 10 years ago, a little more. Uh, to this date, the city has not civilianized those titles um, in, in con con contradiction to the arbitrator's awards. Um, and this has cost the city $30 million a year, roughly. Um, you do the math if you go by 10 years. Uh, those police officers and traffic agents, et cetera, should be out policing, they are able-bodied people we're talking about, uh, they should be out policing, and the city should stop wasting taxpayers' dollars by this. So we are asking that the, um, uh, there needs to be an audit. We have asked for audits, and we believe an audit's gonna be done, uh, and that will bring light to this issue as well. So we're requesting that the city council leadership and membership engage the NYPD and city administration to complete the requirements of the three arbitration case decisions and finish civilianization for the police administrative aid positions so as to stop wasting city tax dollars and enhance public safety. We also request any financial assistance be given to the NYPD if necessary to complete these legal requirements. So the issue about finances goes directly to also the staffing at 911. Uh, we're requesting 500 additional hirees in 911. There are now two PSAC centers uh, that both of them now have empty cubicles not being used that could be used to enhance safety of, of the uh, public. Overtime has ticked up uh, in the last three years, $3 million, $1 million a year from $6 million to uh, about $9 million, over $9 million last year. Um, and that indicates people are being forced to work overtime because there's understaffing. Texting has not begun yet. Imaging, if it happens, has not begun yet. We have requested a separate, um, New York being as kind of a special place in terms of population and diversity. We have requested um, a separate unit for texting and imaging. We don't know if that's gonna happen, but regardless, the present workload will be increased because texting takes somewhat longer to deal with. Um, also, the city uh, is not getting the fair share of the surcharge tax dollars from Albany. They, if you look at the budget, 
it does say in the budget that there is 911 tax dollars coming in, surcharge, but the city collects that. We don't even know if the city is properly paying the NYPD that, and we don't know if the NYPD is actually spending that money on 911. We don't know that, although it says they're getting that. According to the articles that are in the newspapers, which I have given to you, uh, the FCC has found, this is a quote, the FCC, this is in January, has found New York to be diverter of 911 fees every year since 2009. They haven't reported on it, um, and they need to spend that money in the state for 911, and we're asking the support of the city council on that. Thank you for your letter. And um, we need to get clarity on how much the city is actually getting, if anything, because apparently about 50% of it is not coming to the city at least, if not all of it. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Richards and Councilmember Landers. My name is Shane Lansman. Pardon. <laughs> uh, my name is Shane Karaya. I'm a representative <laughs> of the Center for Court Innovation. Uh, I'm here to request that the council continue to support the Center for Court Innovation as it seeks to renew and strengthen the work we do with over 75,000 uh, New Yorkers in early diversion, youth, and adult and alternatives to incarceration. Uh, researchers have documented that our operating programs throughout the five boroughs have decreased violence, aided victims, and reduced the use of jail. In fact, I also personally believe in these programs as a participant from over 16 years ago where I was high risk. Uh, to continue to accomplish the work that we're doing, we seek continuation funding of our core citywide ask, our youth-focused supervised release programming, and our pre-court uh, project reset diversion programming. With Project Reset, it's been shown specifically and evaluated to resolve cases significantly more quickly than the traditional court process, and participants are also evaluated to have had a lower likelihood and frequency for new arrests. Building off of this program's success, we'd like to continue to expand this throughout the city with the mid-year fiscal year 19 support that Council provided to bring it uh, to Brooklyn fully. We also ask for Council to support innovative public safety models in neighborhoods where New Yorkers have access issues to uh, quality programming. Specifically to that end, we'd like to request the support from Council for the creation of the Far Rockaway Justice Center. Uh, as you know, it can take members within that community up to two hours to get to court-based programming as well as for compliance issues. Uh, with council support, we would be able to start a center that would bring quality programming to that neighborhood as well as provide an additional outpost in Queens where Project Reset could be launched when appropriate. Uh, next, we would like to seek the city council support in bringing the driver accountability program citywide. This would also complement a uh, bill held to hold reckless drivers accountable throughout the city. Uh, since 2015, the program that we have been operating in Brooklyn has been evaluated to show a 40% reduction in recidivism for the charges that are served, and we hope to bring this to all New Yorkers within the coming years. Uh, finally, we also ask councils to support expanding two mental health initiatives that have been identified by our court-based operating programs as in specific need for giving mental health services to diverted populations when they're in community as opposed to Rikers. As you know, mental health is a significant issue that's often unaddressed within the criminal justice system, and we've made pinpoint requests uh, to bring better programming for vulnerable populations and court-involved youth. In uh, Brooklyn, this would be as simple as bringing a bilingual therapist who can serve the needs of youth who currently don't have access to someone who speaks their language directly, which would eliminate the need for translators in providing something as sensitive and nuanced as mental health treatment. Uh, additionally, also for those who have psychiatric needs and prescriptions, we would seek a psychiatrist who can, act, who can review what they have for their prescriptions and continue to give them um, oversight while they're completing mental health mandated programming. Uh, we've also this year been able to uh, receive support from two district attorney's uh, offices in the Bronx and Brooklyn with whom we've included letters of support from them and application summaries for our mental health expansion asks are also included. Thank you for your time to speak today. Thank you. Good afternoon, um, Chair uh, Richards and Councilmember Lansman. Um, my name is Audacia Ray. I'm the Director of, of Community Organizing and Public Advocacy at the New York City Anti-Violence Project. And for almost 40 years, AVP has served New York's LGBTQ and HIV-affected survivors of violence. We do direct services and advocacy. We run a 24-7 
bilingual English Spanish hotline. Um, and the hotline and the organization generally are the only um, certified rape crisis counseling center for LGBTQ people in the entire state of New York. So we, sur we receive a hotline call from, from survivors every three hours, and then um, we connect them with free counseling, um, economic empowerment, and legal services. So survivors can make safety plans, get order pr uh, protection, and make decisions about how they want to utilize law enforcement in their personal situations. We work towards public safety by providing services for individuals who've survived violence and by centering their needs. And we collaborate with community members across the city to build safety and community among many different identities. When we think about public safety, we think about how we build safety together. And for AVP and, LG and the LGBTQ people we serve, public safety is, not about have, is, is about having access to affordable housing, livable wages, and workplaces that don't discriminate, and being able to walk down the street without fear of harassment. So in uh, 2017, we know that um, 325 New Yorkers reported hate crimes to NYPD, and these were across many different identities. Um, about half of those were um, Jewish New Yorkers. And um, for AVP, um, in that same time period, we received 282 phone calls to our hotline of folks um, reporting hate violence incidents. So there's, you know, there's a gap between hate violence incidents and hate crimes. Um, folks, uh, you know, the hate crime statute has like a, a, a high bar for what a hate crime is defined as. Um, but people in our communities experience lots of different kinds of bias incidents and, and hate violence. So it's really important for us to be able to um, support folks and to meet their needs that are not necessarily met by the NYPD. Um, and we also know that there are lots of other organizations throughout the city that do this kind of work in their own specific communities, some of whom we've been working with um, on the idea of a hate violence prevention initiative that we're seeking support for this year. Um, some of those other groups include the Arab American Association of New York, um, Jews for Racial and Economic Justice, the Audre Lorde uh, Project, um, and the Brooklyn Movement Center. Um, so we are starting to ask for support around um, that project. It's all focused on community-based services and not policing and, and prosecution. Uh, lastly, uh, AVP is also joining with the Trans Equity Initiative, and we're seeking support for the services that we provide that are specific to trans, gender nonconforming, and non-binary people. Um, who face lots of violence in their relationships, um, on the streets, um, in housing, and at their jobs. So we are every day supporting TGNC and B people and um, combating violence in their own lives and recovering and surviving. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Ralph, you said uh, you anticipate an audit. Who's doing the audit? Uh, well, we've asked the, uh, the city controller. To A city controller. And, yes. So you anticipate he's going to audit. The head um, okay. Right. Great. Okay. Hope that's not a surprise that I. No. Oh, okay, I, got it. <laughs> I don't know if it is. Alrighty. Shouldn't and, be a surprise. And then on the 911 uh, surcharge stuff, mm -hmm. obviously, I think we just sent the letter. Right. You said the letter, right? Yeah, I said, said, I actually said thank you for that, but I kind of like. Oh, it's okay. Whatever. We, we're here to get down. some stuff done. Um, yeah. So we're going to look deeper Can I say into. Can you about 911 if you don't mind? The surcharge? Say it again. The, about the 911 yes. surcharge. The 911 surcharge, by law, is dedicated to 911. And apparently, according to newspaper articles, not just the Post, but an article in an art, upstate New York that's included in that, it's not going there. Um, and we, yet we have an issue in Albany now, congestive pricing. And the money people are talking about is dedicated to the MTA. It's supposed to be. Okay, so if you're not doing it in one place, then what's happening, what could happen with the other place? What's to guarantee anything? This money should be coming to the 911 systems statewide, all of it, not a percentage, not 50%, all of it. So I just wanted to get that in as well. And we Thank want to make sure it's not going into what we know as the mm -hmm. general fund. You know what the general yes, fund is? The general Generally, fund. we spend it any way we wish. <laughs> um, so, uh, <laughs> um, so we look forward well, to following up on that. Well, that's why there's a shortage. It could be when there's a shortage. You know? yeah. But the city might be spending what it's getting. I'm not saying the city isn't. Right. Okay. They generate a certain amount. But from what the state comes down is the lion's share, though. Right. The big uh, amount. Okay. 
Okay. Thank you so much, all. Uh, thank you all for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Last panel here. We're going to go to Tawaki Kamasu, Kelly. Oh, you had a question? Oh, oh, sorry. Kelly Gina Price, Close Rosies, and MJ Williams. Hi, good afternoon, um, Chair. Oh, I'm sorry, should I wait for you? To sure, you may begin, and once again, he is well-behaved. Frank Sinatra, thank Frank you. Frank Sinatra is well-behaved. Thank you. All righty. I have cookies in my pocket. So um, thank you for holding this hearing. I can't believe how timely it is. I've never been in a hearing with the NYPD that's actually running on time. Kudos to you. <clears throat> I had prepared my testimony, as I always do, but after hearing what the NYPD and the CCRB had to say about their Special Victims Division. I hope you don't mind. I'm going to rework it and resubmit it probably by 8 o'clock tonight, if you don't mind, to your staff. Um, I want to go over four quick points. I appreciate the extra minute. Um, one doesn't really have a lot to do with the Special Victims, and I want to center my testimony around that. But as you know, and I heard uh, uh, Commissioner O'Neill uh, make reference to the DAS, the Domain Alert System, that the NYPD has partnered with Microsoft to create. I, I've mentioned this in the past, that the NYPD receives a royalty share of that particular system whenever it is sold to other jurisdictions um, around the world or around the country. So the NYPD has a completely separate revenue flow that is not required to be funneled into the general fund or into any fund that has New York City Council oversight, and it, it's the exact same situation. Is this the NYPD who's re returned? Oh, it's a shame because we really need them to listen to us, and I always appreciate when you make them leave someone behind. I wish they had this time in the CCRB as well. But the, the money that is flowing into the NYPD coffers from Palantir and from Microsoft is not accountable. There's no sign of it in their budget, and it's potentially hundreds of millions of dollars that you're allowing the NYPD to used to create these systems, these McCarthyistic systems that label us as worthy of police services or not, with absolutely no oversight. Something has to be done about this royalty money. You're, you're giving them far too much slack. Uh, as you know, I have a lawsuit against uh, the city because of the way that I have been demarcated as a fabricator of claims because I have um, an ex-intimate partner who was a confidential informant for the NYPD, and he used to beat the crap out of me and the 28th Precinct would just laugh at me and tell me that the only thing they could do to help me is move me to Nevada, because at the time he was trafficking me, and they were saying, oh, you're just a filthy hoe, Ms. Price. The only thing we'll do to help you is move you to Nevada. I've testified about these things in the past, but there's a reason that we're labeled this way as survivors of sexual violence, because there's no oversight into these systems, and the number one thing you can do to help survivors of sexual violence is take away the NYPD's ability to operate inside of a star chamber. So, also, the NYPD is using city law department resources um, to fight Palantir. They're in a massive legal battle right now that you may or may not be aware of. So, why are they taking the money from the royalty share with these companies and then spending the city's money that doesn't come out of those royalty streams to fight with those same companies? Someone really needs to dig into this because these systems are being sold to Saudi Arabia, to Israel, to Burma, Myanmar, and all this money is flowing not into any place that you're able to have oversight. I've spent all of my time talking about this, but I really want to talk about the Special Victims Division. Why was the new chief of SVD not here today? Why did Chief Shea get to be the mouthpiece of the SVU? It's astounding to me that they made a really big deal. They say that they work with advocates in the community. I'm part of the Downstate Coalition, and they don't work with us. I heard Chief, say, chief Shea say that um, they work with the advocates to do an audit every year. Well, that's nothing new. They've been doing that for the last seven years. But the cases that are chosen to be audited are chosen by the NYPD. Um, 
I have a lot of other problems with the CCRB. The number one thing that I had problem and I wanted to relate an, um, a personal anecdote about making a complaint about sexual harassment within the last year to the CCRB that was founded. It went to administrative trial and then that particular officer was exonerated. And again, the only thing that I got was a letter when the complaint was originally founded and then a letter a year later when the officer was exonerated. And as a survivor, this particular workflow does not give us justice, it does not show us the pathway to justice, and there's so much more work to be done. I actually don't recommend that the CCRB do anything regarding sexual assault and, um, and rape as far as investigations, and I've testified that we need a new city agency for this extensively, and I'd like to push this. I'll proffer this in my, in my written testimony. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to correct you on the units of appropriation. That is something that we discussed today, and we certainly are pushing them to certainly be more transparent in their budget. We have a long way to go, uh, but I just wanted to acknowledge that the council has been pushing, and, and God willing, this, this year we'll make more progress there. And I want to uh, thank you for your, for your words on SVD. We share your con the common goal and vision of improving that division, continuing to do that. Ma'am. Press your uh, button, it's gonna light up red. My name is MJ Williams, and thank you, Council Member Richards and your colleagues for giving us all time here to speak with you. Like um, Ms. Price, I'm here to ask for accountability, excuse me, for oversight, not for money, which might make you um, a bit relieved. Um, and in particular, about having gone through this 50 some odd page report, um, that was supported the discussions earlier today, looking at the PMMR performance measures for NYPD that learned today stands for Preliminary Mayor's Management Report, which is mandated as an assessment of agencies like the NYPD by the city charter. And within the six indicia for NYPD, there is um, a glaring omission, and that's on the validity and outcome of NYPD arrests. According to data from the Division of Criminal Justice Services, NYPD's uh, felony arrests have an 80% failure rate. That means 80% of them end in dismissals, drop, they are, those charge, felony charges are dropped, or they end in acquittal. I think you all probably know that when you're looking then at the 20% that end in convictions, the majority of those are by pleas, and a fair number of those pleas are then also coerced. An 80% failure rate is, I think without question, a damning and shameful record for any agency. When it comes to this agency, the NYPD, it's not only embarrassing, but it's dangerous and harmful. With each arrest, NYPD can kill, injure, and also at a minimum seize the liberty of your constituents and other New Yorkers and other people in New York City. Also that failure rate, it deserves more study, but I believe that you would agree that it's fueled by flimsy probable cause requirements at arraignment false reports and what is very commonly and, and anecdotally called test lying by NYPD, and overall lack of meaningful oversight or discipline within NYPD, and then through the absence of this or something like it being an indicia of NYPD's performance, lack of oversight also from city council and the executive, the mayor. So what I'm asking for is that the council must address NYPD based on the outcome of its arrests and its other interactions with the public. And then specifically with regards to the budget hearing today, um, understanding that NYPD is seeking an increase in pay above what the, um, has been offered through the preliminary budget is to not reward this agency, that agency, NYPD, with pay increases given just this one indicia of failure rate. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tawaki Komatsu. I've testified to you previously. I'm gonna conduct myself entirely lawful today. Um, as I've stated previously, my testimony today is for Federal Judge Lorna Schofield, who is assigned to my federal lawsuit against the city. Yesterday, there was a public hearing at 4.30 p.m. in the Blue Room in City Hall that the mayor conducted. I was illegally kicked out of that public hearing while I was testifying. 
here's a video that confirms what I just stated, uh, Ms. Ms. Schofield or Lorna. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor. Good afternoon. Um, you and I have talked a few times about this company called NTT Data. You've said in the press recently that um, too much money is in the wrong hands. So for the benefit of this audience, I'm going to begin my testimony by playing back a video that of our conversation on March 15th of 2017 at your town hall in Chelsea. I don't um, know if that's uh, something actually we accept in Actually, the First Amendment rights say yeah, I can First Amendment that. rights are great. I just want to say I don't know if we accept that in the testimony, so we should... Keep moving forward. Okay, let me just say a quick. Tell you. So, so, so this is the aftermath. Face me. Can I get your name? Yeah. Right here. Let me cut to the chase. So, that was a public hearing about labor rights. I testified to Mr. Lankman, who's paying absolutely no attention to me right now, about a company called Entity Data and Wage Theft that I continue to be That's not to. true. I'm multitasking. Um, no, your line of sight isn't on my testimony. Um, that's irrespective of that. Um, so bottom line is um, I'm going to file papers in my federal lawsuit tomorrow, essentially saying I walked into this room to testify. Mr. Longman was paying me absolutely no attention whatsoever. So therefore, I can't, can't rely on the city council for re appropriate redress. Um, also, there's another video that about body camera footage. I was illegally stopped and Fritz assaulted, injured. I'm still waiting to get the full me. video, the full body yeah. camera video, for something more than a year ago. In that corridor? Yes. Now you're seizing my property with, and violating my rights. Due process without deprivation no, of property. Hello. No due Hello. process. Give me my wallet. You have no rights. That's his. That's his. This is, excuse me. Is there a commanding officer? So here's a, here's a kicker. While I was in NYPD custody, they illegally lost possession of my wallet. They didn't search for my wallet thereafter. So in terms of identity theft, um, if the roles were reversed, if you were illegally stopped, if you were illegally arrested, the NYPD lost possession of your wallet, your personal identifying information, you would think that they have a legal responsibility to look after your property to, to safeguard it. So if I'm testifying before you, if you're the chairman of this public safety committee, people like me would think you have some authority to actually take appropriate corrective action such that people like me don't have to keep walking into this room to waste our time to testify to people like you when at the end of the day, nothing becomes of that. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your testimony. Okay, uh, seeing any others from the public who wish to testify. Seeing none. Uh, this hearing is now over. Bye, Frank Sinatra.